Okay, we'll call Wendy to order. Welcome to the July meeting, July workshop meeting. Today, uh, today's workshop is on uh, engineering upgrade and time certain four o'clock we'll have plan for water including our risk assessment. So that will be a uh, time certain four o'clock. So if you all uh, join me for the special issue. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Secretary, will you call the roll, please? Division 5? Here. Division 4? Here. Division 3? Here. Division 2? Here. Division 1? Here. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is our workshop format. So if you'd like to participate at any time in the meeting, just uh, raise your hand, shout out. We're not very formal in this process. If you're at home and watching on Zoom, you'll start on your phone to, and maybe the chairman will recognize see you on the screen. Let's <laughs> with that mic right now. Okay, and as always, our general manager, Jennifer Hensel, will be uh, uh, facilitating that meeting. Today, and uh, first up is Doug Roderick, Insurance Department with the update for the year. Great. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, President Beer Wagon, members of the board and the public. Um, so we're here today to talk about, basically give an update on the six months of where we are in terms of our capital improvement program for the 2022 budget that the board approved. Uh, I'll give the, the engineering side on the uh, on the water side, and then Kim will come up and give a presentation for the, for the hydro side. Um, can you go ahead and get that PowerPoint started, Chris? Thank you. Your hands raised. My hands raised. I told you not. <laughs> <laughs> How do I lower my hand? No, I can. I was trying to get the full screen so I can see the participants. There you go. Are you going to touch it again and go down? Uh, yeah, I certainly do. You seem to be rolling forward. <laughs> you don't need to raise your hand to talk. Hey, Chris. You seem to be Sorry, Dad. Oh, it's not me. <laughs> oh, oh, Chris. Are you going to show it to Yeah. Oh, there we go. All right. Good now? Yep, we're good. Okay. Okay, um, before we start on the... Uh, the updates of the 2022 budget. I just want to get a quick um, update on, and we talked about before when we approved the last EIP that we are going to be forming our budget review committee, which would be with management staff. That's where we're going to go through, score all the different projects for our scoring sheets, and then from that we would build the, the program for both next year and our five-year plan. So we've started, we've implemented that. We've actually got um, most all of our projects scored. And so we're meeting next week to actually identify what those look like based on priorities from the scoring and then which projects we want to move forward with for the foreseeable future, which is the 2023 budget, and then moving forward from there. So just want to let you guys know that we are moving forward with that process. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Just jump in. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you said it's only the management staff that goes through doing the engineering staff is not involved in this at all? Uh, for the initial scoring of it, it's just management staff, which is myself, operations, um, Greg's involved with it, maintenance is involved with it. The Those develop the, the project, and then we score them based on that. And then from there, those projects will be dealt with by the engineering staff. They will help us in terms of developing cost estimates, those types of things that we'll need to do as part of the budget, but they're not involved with the initial scoring of the project. But isn't there a lot of the scoring criteria I'm trying to remember? I left I grab tomorrow. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So um, a lot of the scoring is billability and readability and, and how long it would take and that kind of thing. So when, at what point does the, does the engineering staff come in? You said they don't come in on the scoring part of it. Correct. They only come in on the implementation part of it. So they don't well, have... they'll also be involved with the development of the cost estimate. Stuff. You know, the, the initial scoring doesn't have costs involved with it, right? It's just it meets the priorities of is it going to impact um, 
potential future capital or reduce those costs? Is it a, an environmental impact? Is it an impact to the overall uh, uh, delivery system? Does the project affect 20 people or does it affect 400 customers? Those types of things get dealt with at the management level that don't necessarily need the individual engineers involved with that. So once we get these and we start to develop which projects we want, engineering will get involved and they'll need to start developing some initial cost estimates, constructability timeframes, how long we think it's going to take, get through design, get through construction, and we put that into the scoring overall CIP matrix sheet. Oh, so you do end up incorporating that data, but yeah. the staff reviews it. Correct. You don't make the list and say, here, go make. No, no, correct. Correct. So, so in that sheet that you saw, the summary sheet, which has the project information, what it is, and the estimates based on the different year budget cycle, um, those will all be worked on internally through engineering. They'll help develop those sheets to determine which project as we move forward. forward. <laughs> Mr. Roderick is referring to the actual scoring, which we utilize for pre presenting to the board what our proposed prioritization is for the projects. The scoping of the projects, which is contained in the project information sheet, is developed with input from the appropriate staff, whether it be maintenance or engineering. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, here's the list of the projects that we had for the 2022 CIP that the board approved. Um, one of the first things you'll see is that several of these don't have a lot of money spent, um, which is pretty typical because part of what happens with these projects is the engineer gets the project, and then they got to make sure the scope makes sense, right? In terms of when you replace this or fix this or do this, you actually should have considered we should also do that. So we make sure we all understand what the project scope is, and then it gets into design right away all those types of things, survey work, all that stuff, which is all done internally. So there's no money spent on these projects because these don't reflect staff time in terms of the money spent. This would be contractor time. This would be uh, right-of-way costs. This would be um, SQL work, that type of thing, consulting fees. So, so is there anywhere we could find out the total scope of what we think the project's going to cost, uh, the impact of its total dollars on what each project? you look and see how much overall it's going to be? Clarify, isn't the budgeted amount included staff time, and you're just saying that the 2022 expenditure correct, still correct, reflects correct. labor? Yes, thank you. The budgeted amount includes the labor. That had, I guess, the meant cost so for engineering, etc. Yeah. Sorry to clarify that, but yes. Yeah, so one of the challenges with how capital improvement projects are funded and how we do the operational budget is currently the district practice is to load all salary and labor costs within the operation budget. So for the purposes of the project Doug's referring to, that would be Fund 10. And then you'll recall we moved capital projects for water to Fund 15. So in order to reconcile those final labor costs to a particular capital improvement project, we do it via journal entry because we don't have a real-time ability to charge and deduct from operations. So it'll, it gets reconciled at the end when we're fully capitalizing the asset. So we're working towards that real time. Yeah, it's just one of the imperfections of our current process that right. we'll continue to try to improve. Um, currently, as you recall, we don't have electronic timesheets. We're still using paper timesheets. So once we get transitioned into our interim um, financial system upgrade, we are hoping to start to get into an actual electronic time sheet and then finally get this entire issue resolved when we do the full upgrade, which will likely not be for at least two years. How do you, Doug, just out of curiosity, yeah. how do you manage time uh, do you have? I mean, I'm just wondering, to your point of that time isn't shown on the 2022 expenditures, how do you reconcile then uh, labor costs as you're going along to ensure that you're within the target budget? So so we can periodically pull the a full audit trail to see where we're at in terms of cost spent. And uh, that gets done on an occasional basis. I don't do it on a regular basis um, because my staff time is already budgeted for the year. and. And I understand, I think, what your question is, which are they spending too much time on one project right. and therefore it's going to get reflected on that. Um, so I haven't. I, I haven't done a real extensive of that. Normally it's, 
here's your projects, and you need to get those forward. And there'll be times where they may work for three or four weeks straight on one project, and then they may not touch it again for four or five weeks or a month or two months or three months if sure. right away is working on it or we're going through a secret process or that type of thing. Yeah, in order for real-time monitoring of labor costs as they're charged to capital projects to be monitored and uh, reported out on, it would we essentially what would be required is that for every capital improvement project, we'd have to open up a whole set of account code that would cover all of the different labor accounts. And so you would have, you know, I don't know how many capital projects we have this year between hydro, rec, and water, but we would essentially be opening, you know, 30 times nine accounts, right? It's making my head spin right now. It, it right. is complicated. So we do it in more what I would refer to as a quick and dirty way for accounting purposes right now through journal entries that are reconciled basically at the end of the year. So the real-time monitoring of costs isn't done on a granular level where you know we would be confident down to the penny, but time is tracked through the timesheets and then the journal entries are made on the back end. Yes. I have another question. Um, so regardless of what department you work in, if you're going to work on the David Way pump station project number 2322, wouldn't on your paper time sheet mm -hmm. you would write on 2322, I spent this time, mm -hmm. and then they enter 2322 into the whatever program that you guys use or your spe spreadsheet or however you guys do it. Um, you can't just, because I look on the warrant on the pro project, you look and see, you look at 2322 on the monthly warrant, and it has it. So you have it on the warrant. You had it from all the years. The, the, the warrant project was... project report that is reported with the warrant. So remember when I keep keep referring to that your traditional project and facility reports that the board has been seeing for the past 15 years, they're they're not actual. It's not actual numbers. It doesn't tie out to your financials, and this is one of my issues with spending so much time tracking this ancillary data that doesn't tie out to your actual financials because it's not rooted in any real data. What do you mean it doesn't tie to the so when So I just explained, so let me give just a real simple example. So I, we're, Doug is Fund 10, there's only one employee in Fund 10, and 100% of his labor is coded to Fund 10. Within the labor coding, there's nine to 10 different account codes for um, FICA and workers' comp and health insurance and retiree and vacation, sick leave, uh, admin leave, salaries. All that right now is all coded into all of those accounts under Fund 10. In order to accomplish what you're wanting, which is actually tying everything out to the capital projects, we essentially would have to open up each one of those 10 labor codes under each and every single capital project number code because it's in order for it to tie it out. Otherwise, it, we do it by journal entry at the end because we don't have the, we don't have the staff time right now. We just yeah, also yeah. don't have the system right now right. to do that. So when we run payroll, we can account and pro track from project and facilities, which is what I call off book tracking. It doesn't tie to your financials. It's completely off book. We can account for that, but it's not tying back into your actual fund financials. And because when we hit, uh, when we're cutting, say Doug, the one person department, a check, it's coming out of from an actual financial perspective from Fund 10 only. We do the back end reconciliation with journal entries to create these project and facility reports, but they're not tying out. So I wouldn't get too caught up in it right now. It is one of the limitations of our current system, but it's an easy area to improve as we continue to move forward. And we're working out of it. We are working out of it. it. You know, it's a huge, it's a huge transition for the district to clean up. So, um, our first, first big movement to cleaning up a lot of those issues was opening the capital funds. So you'll recall previously everything was jammed into Fund 10 and all the overhead expenditures. So last budget year we pulled everything apart, and we're just continuing to pull the pieces apart. One of the things we have to be careful of is when we're doing these transitions of not trying to buy off too big a piece of an apple at once because it overwhelms our accounting staff. Well, then how valuable is, what is or would that information be anyway? And is there, is there efficiency savings or cost savings by having all that and there was a cost benefit of that? 
For capital projects, I say it's highly beneficial. Um, yeah, I, I do recommend that we go there at some point because some capital projects, so for example, I'm too blind to see all the way over there. Um, so for example, the DS Canal shotgun culverts, that's a project that we could design in-house and we could also construct in-house. So the, you know, a lot of the big expenditures you're going to see on the warrants is going to be essentially materials purchased. So for a higher level of transparency for those types of projects, ones that we're designing or have a heavy, a heavier staff workload versus a construction, something we're writing a contract for, it's important to understand the total cost of those projects because you can get a lot of cost creep. And then you'll also start to... Cost creep, there's a word. Cost creep. Well, then you also start it's to... Thing. Push yeah. Push yeah. It's like cost increase. It's like mission creep. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also it's important because a lot of times people think think that things that we do are very simple, and sometimes when you start talking about environmental permitting and reporting and those things, you know, the in for example, we've had this with some of Kean's projects. Um, you know, when you have a high level of electrical technical design that's needed, you might be spending a lot more on the soft costs than you do on your hard project costs. And then it's important to understand that when you're making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as all of the nickel and dime facility tracking that we do, I don't think that that is important and is somewhat of a waste of resources when the numbers are not tying out. But when we get to actual timesheets, a timesheet system, and things are more automated, you know, then then we start building back on tracking. Right now, we're doing a lot of tracking that didn't really matter, didn't tie out, and didn't have meaning behind it. Well, that's, that's right. Yeah. But we're gonna, we'll, but once once we get back into a new system and things are more automated and we're more efficient and we have automatic timesheets, um, you know, then you start building those things back. Did you say that the material costs are more than the staff costs? Is that, 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 that can. You didn't have to do some material costs that, that are. It was it was a fake example. So in sometimes there are projects, <laughs> there there are projects where you can have. Um, you know, you can have it, typically your construction and material costs are lumped into one category and your soft costs are design, engineering, overhead, permitting, those types of things. Usually you see the bulk of your expenditures in construction and purchase materials. There are some projects where you have a skewed, yes, the distribution of the project funds is skewed from what you would normally expect in a capital project. Yeah, measure twice, cut once. Oh, yeah, and labor is typically any project using labor is three to four times the material cost. It costs to implement the project, the design, and the management, and the environmental, and the permitting. Those are very, they're not insignificant costs. Yeah, so the rule of thumb is that design and construction inspection, environmental is about 20% of a construction project. Um, when, you know, you can get into a more technical electrical type project, for example, some of Kean's projects, and you can see some really high design costs that you also could, when we have to start fabricating components, you can see some high material costs that will definitely outweigh the actual labor costs on the construction end. What is our definition of a capital project? So a capital project. Yeah. I mean, I'm concerned that we are going down a rabbit hole. We are. We're, we're not going to get done. Yeah. Yeah. So, and now we've got 40 well, minutes. Well, hopefully we've read all of the documents. I think that's what it is. Well, it seems like we've kind of been there to what is the definition of a capital project. But I just want to get, I want to hear what Key and That's the capital project. So capital, I'll just answer it really quick so everybody's clear because this question comes up a lot. Capital project is something that has an asset value to it. So equipment is a capital project. Construction projects are capital projects. Routine repair and maintenance that does not add value to your asset is not a capital project. That would be an operational expenditure. And the reason why this is important is from a financial perspective and that your assets impact your fund balance. They initially increase your fund balance due to the value of the asset, a new asset or increased value of an asset. And then over time, it decreases your fund balance because of the depreciation of the asset. So, all right. Thanks, Jennifer. Or in the case of antique tractors that go up. Those are not assets the district should have, and no, to strive no. to auction them off on eBay. All right. So, uh, first one, David Wade Pump Station. Um, one of you remember we actually had purchased the prepackaged pump station, and we were waiting for it to be delivered. Um, we would have anticipated this to already be installed by now, but 
due to the lead time issues with the generator. We now don't expect the generator until December. So we hope we can get the facility in by December. It may actually roll into January or February before we actually can get it installed just because we're waiting for the generator to show up, which is backlog because of all the chaos that's going on in the world out there today. You're going to find that with a lot of our projects because of supply chain issues and delivery <coughs> of key components, a lot of things are slipping. And we're going to have to get through them quickly because Ken still has his. Yep. Open fast. So a lot of it, obviously, you can read and then ask the pertinent questions. So we can give Ken his time in the spotlight. We're just, these are just updates of where we are. Yeah, where we're at today. Right. Yep. And we wrote all this. Project. Right. You've seen all these. You approved yeah. them at the last. That's month. right. The budget. Yep. Uh, next one's Lake Wildwood treatment plan upgrades. Uh, this one's basically on hold as we take a look at some different opportunities and options for the PEP. Uh, which potentially looks at getting rid of the Lloyd Wildwood treatment plant altogether. So we're looking at uh, cost analysis related to the O&M and the replacement of the treatment plant over a 25 and a 50 year window uh, versus keeping it as a peaking plant um, versus a couple of different routes into Penn Valley, et cetera. So we've got a meeting scheduled, I think, in about two weeks internally to talk about the different options and what we think makes the most sense in terms of moving forward with the project. So. We're focusing on that piece, which takes some time and effort, and so this one gets put on. Well, um, I appreciate you taking a step back to look at the bigger mm -hmm. picture. Yeah, really right. I mean, that's part of the. Yeah. Do you have a deadline when you have to go forward with the upgrade? No. Uh, next one, Hip Hill. This is one I knows as well. Um, we're trying to finalize and finish up. Uh, the final permitting uh, and access uh, access routes to get to this facility. Uh, some of the material has been purchased. Contractor is ready to hit the ground running as soon as we do get our final permits um, and the abilities to get out there and start to work. So I anticipate within the end of this week, the first part of next week, we'll know whether we need to uh, go ahead and continue to push forward, try to get the project built this year. We may have to wait and push it out to the following year. We're starting to run out of a window in terms of the in-stream work. Um, and so that's the concern that we're going to have to sit and evaluate. Um, we have a permit that allows us to only work to a certain time into October. We might be able to get that extended, but that also impacts the ability of the project. Mother Nature decides to do something foolish and, and dump a ton of water on us in October. Um, Not if we have it. Potentially impact it. So it's really just a yeah. risk assessment as yeah. well. Can the contractor get it done? Can we get it done and uh, be able to move forward with it? We would much, we prefer just to get it going and be done with it. So we're pushing forward as far as we can. The agencies are, for the most part, helping out and been very supportive, trying to get the permitting process through as quick as possible. So what about the easements? Yeah, so still we're, working got, we're still working on the one. We've got easements through through the one properties. Uh, we're trying to finalize easements through the other one to get access into that. Is it stagnant? Is it hanging up? Or is it uh, we're just having some they have some concerns about some of the things we're doing and how it impacts their abilities and what they need to do for their subdivision, et cetera. So they just need to make sure they're not putting themselves in a in a bad spot. Yeah, we'll, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll make the final call next week. It's not the money doesn't go away if the project gets moved to next year. We are pushing for this year, but there definitely is a risk to going to doing in the stream work under a rush and trying to fight weather, um, you know, the fines can be significant. So we're pushing on it and we'll make the final call next week. And this is normal. They're actually pushing this project on the schedule that we've been pushing it on probably wasn't the best thing to do. I'm a big believer in these types of projects. That when you, you when you seem to push them before they're ready, you just end up causing yourselves problems. But yeah. we'll make the call. Uh, banner isolation tank. Um, this is one where you start to take a look at what the overall scope is. Um, originally, it was to install a bypass pipe so that we can take that tank offline. So since then, we've actually had some discussions. Operations is going to draw that tank down. We're going to inspect it to see if one if it's in good shape or potentially can be fixed or repaired, or maybe we don't need it anymore, in which case the bypass pipe gets bigger and we get rid of that tank altogether. So so that's part of that whole iterative process, right? We have a project get started and then 
based on that, it kind of changes as we as we continue to move forward with it. Uh, office ramp, we should have the revised submitted drawings into the city um, by the end of this week, first of next week. Uh, we had to do some additional work to meet uh, the ADA requirements for the parking lot, et cetera, which required us to go back and do some additional drawings and, and layouts in addition to just the structural. So it's just a iterative process. It will be a relatively short bid time frame because it's a relatively straightforward project. So we'd expect to bid that hopefully by the end of this month in the beginning of August and have a contract on board to take care of that. Most likely now would be September. It'd be a relatively short time frame to construct that. Uh, Christian Life Way, uh, it's been around a long time. Um, so as we started to go forward this year, we find out through Caltrans that they're actually looking at doing some improvements to Highway 20, I mean Highway 49, um, which potentially changes what we want to do with this project. So now we're kind of working with the Caltrans time frame in terms of what they want to do. We want to make sure we don't do something and have to remove it or tear it out or replace it, et cetera. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also looking at some additional right away stuff, so that's starting to get out and meet with property owners, which takes time and effort uh, to meet with them, to give them an understanding of what we're trying to do, et cetera. But this is one where we may be able to get to Caltrans as part of their widening process to pay for a portion of the project. And so it makes sense for us to, to not try to push too hard on that if we can get them to, to do that as part of their widening project process. So. Uh, DS shotguns. Um, they're basically done. I mean, the boxes are sized. We're ready to go. This one will be one that will get done in the fall when we have an outage. So even if we were all done today and ready to go, we wouldn't do it right now. Um, so anyway, we expect this to be done in the fall. It's a pretty straightforward project. Um, North Day Road. Uh, we have met with all the property owners. Remember, this is the first phase for this year, which was just to get the right of way that we needed to be able to go in there and replace this pipeline. Um, so we've met with all those that have actually been very supportive of the project. We're all very excited to have new pipe, a new hydrant, et cetera, out there. And so it's just a matter of going through and, and identifying the cost and then getting folks to sign up. But for the most part, everything I've heard from our right-of-way folks is that everybody's in agreement to, to want to help move forward. So we just need to put together offer packages. We expect to have that done this year for sure. Design's almost complete. Um, once we get the final right-of-ways, we had to make any tweaks, we can do that. But this one will be ready to go, shelf ready, and be ready to go for construction next year, which is what we had proposed to budget for next year to build this one. These have been on the CFP since 2019. Yeah. So how, what, 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 what triggers them to get on the CFP? Well, now we have a process. We have this process so that we're moving the best, forward. The best, all the most projects, shovel ready projects we've had. So we went through the CIP yeah. process and we did the budget right. workshop and we explained. Not well, shovel ready. No, it's shovel not ready. just shovel ready. Priority. Yeah. Priority. Well, and also a capital project, you could have many years in which you have very little construction being completed while you're doing design. And as Doug stated right now, they're working on some of the right of way issues. So that's a normal part of how capital works. We have a lot of projects that we that aren't on this list. I thought this list was for the projects we were going to construct. Uh, so North Day wasn't. So if you look at that, if you look at the it was on the 2022, list. it was 80,000 this year to get rid of all the right of way and the design stuff and any seat work done. Then the next year, yeah. just so 23. Which, okay. yeah. No, the, so as capital improvement project stays on the approved capital improvement project list when there's expenditures identified. A capital expenditure does not necessarily refer to just construction dollars. It also refers to environmental design. So as we stated earlier, when we proposed the capital improvement program for 2022 during the budget process, we explained the new process by which projects are evaluated and proposed to the board. And so this was part of the list of projects that the board approved. Because we're working on the BEP, I would think that going to be a cap that is a capital improvement project we're working on it but the BEP was not an, on the approved not, yeah. capital project this year no no it wasn't on the list and that's what I'm trying to understand is what makes it get on the list I mean why is it on the list it was by the board action, board action. well and also the scoring, scoring yeah. right. presented the scoring. scoring we went over it and then we approved right. Right. the recommendation on this one, 
you mentioned um, fire hydrants. Yeah, there's like a wharf hydrants out there now. Um, they're the old school. I mean, they're just new hydrants, so they're excited to see the new, the new bright so hydrants. So is that sitting. part of what the district is funding, or is that part of the, the This is all district project. This okay. is an old deteriorating pipeline that's been failing, leaking, et cetera. So we're going in there and replacing that. As part of that, we're upgrading the hydrants from the old wharf hydrants to the new hydrants. Yeah, there's a, a significant <coughs> low liability if we were to not replace hydrants that yep. were already there. Mm -hmm. Or being a public benefit agency. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Pet Hill, this is just getting started in terms of the design review. Um, it's a pretty simple little project. You remember a lot of these. Uh, we're going to look small projects because Hemp Hill took up the majority of the budget that we wanted to use for CIP this year. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these are relatively small projects. This is one here. Um, we would anticipate that uh, design to be taken care of here shortly, probably by September, and be ready to go out to be constructed once water season's over, which it wouldn't happen before then anyway. Uh, Sugarloaf Reservoir. <clears throat> this was, again, one of the ones we abandoned in this reservoir. It was leaking. Um, the design's all complete. Uh, this one will actually get done once all the hill reservoir is done, which is the next project. So both of these should be completed in 2022. The designs are done. Um, both have been drained already so that we don't have any um, issues related to safety health concerns. So I have a question about this. Once we abandon the reservoir, then what happens to the under to the property to the real property? I mean, are we does it become excess property or no? There'll be a, there'll be existing facilities on this one. My guess is that we would continue to keep this small piece of property. Okay. Yeah, because we'll have a bypass in there as well as a, yeah. So and it would just be a depression left in the ground. Uh, we may start to fill this one in surely it's actually a berm section that you see from the roads so you actually can't see inside the reservoir from from the public viewpoint and so we would ultimately you know a lot of times on these projects like this if maintenance has excess material they use these as areas to, to put their material in so we fill them up like we did in the uh, uh, what's the, the other treatment plant chip snow mountain same type of thing we've been filling that reservoir in slowly over time yeah uh, let's see, Alta Hill, so this is the one we're currently working on. Um, maintenance is doing this work. Again, this will be, be completed this year. Squirrel Creek, this was one that we added in 2022. Do you remember, uh, this wasn't even on our list, wasn't on our priority list, wasn't on our radar as something that needs to be replaced. Uh, it sprung leaks this spring, um, and so it became an issue, so it got pushed into this year's capital. So we're we're about 80% in design. We've done the we're getting ready for a second internal review on design work. Uh, we've got all the easements already for this for the most part, um, other than some temporary access stuff. And so uh, this will get finished up, and we will bid this out. It should be constructed again. This is a dry facility in the in the winter after irrigation season, so we wouldn't do any work until then anyway. So we'll be ready to go and hit the ground running. Come. October, um, with the understanding that some of this project may leak into 2023 in terms of the construction part of it. And then this one I just threw in there. Uh, this is also here. This is a big project I'm trying to finish up. Um, and so the tank is in service. It is full, is in service. Uh, I had a couple small leaks, which is typical for this type of thing. So contractors working on that. Now we're just working on final. Some of the final pipe connections inside um, to the station, as well as uh, our final um, um, landscaping and fencing, which was part of the contract. So this should be finished up here shortly. So with that, if you have any other questions, I'll hand it off to Ian. Uh, Member of the public, uh, if I would like to uh, ask any questions about the uh, capital improvement. <coughs> Project updates for this year. No, just for water. That's just water project. We're going to hit yeah. hydro. No. Okay. We're going to have to go pretty quick. All right. I can handle that. Welcome, Ken. Thank you.
All right. Uh, so, in the interest of moving quickly, I'll uh, I'll give away the punchline to some a lot of these before we get into the details. Um, we're a, a bit behind schedule from uh, where I would like to be in terms of expenditures, and we're kind of running into four things that are are hitting us pretty hard. Um, first of all, the supply chain issues are really um, on the hydro side of the house becoming a real problem. Um, we're seeing lead times that are uh, quoted to us as 300 working days, which when you do the math on that, that's over a year for. Uh, um, for powerhouse equipment. Um, it's also typical that we uh, we don't burn all of our budget early in this year. A lot of our work happens at outages for hydro. The big fall outages are sept September and October. Um, we're also heavily focused on project closeout this year, um, and so that has delayed us a little bit. And then the, the the one that we've all talked about before is the Deer Creek powerhouse and the workload that that's brought on the department has, has slowed down our capital program a bit. Um, so quickly moving through the jobs, um, the Scotts Flat Spillway repair and upgrades. This is obviously a, a big, big one of interest. Um, we have completed the physical hydraulic modeling, and we've got some pictures of it here. We built, a, yep, yep, built in, uh, built in the lab up in Vancouver. Um, so uh, the the results have shown that it is going to be. It, it, it boils down to it being almost the same cost to replace the entire thing as it is to try and rebuild the thing. Um, so this will be a full remove and replacement of this. Um, we are finalizing the, uh, the modeling reports right now. We're finalizing the alternative selection reports. We'll submit those to DSOD and FERC here in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll wait for their review and then start moving forward on the design in the next year or so. Uh, I'm sorry? FERC and DSOD? How long are you thinking they'll have to have it? Since we're doing the full removal and replacement, um, I expect that they'll 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 give us the thumbs up pretty quick. Um, quick meaning three to six months. Um, so, yeah. So, Ken, I don't know if you have time, but there may be a separate conversation. But um, since this is, I I understood that the investment that we made in that modeling was designed to reduce the overall cost of the stowaway going forward. So, did that? Did that assumption or that belief pan out with this yeah. direction? And so the uh, the original design was this uh, extremely big energy dissipating structure down at the bottom at St. Francis, St. Anthony, some uh, St. Anthony Falls oh, spill, yeah, um, spillway. Typical design. When when they actually started laying that in the field, the walls were 50 feet tall. It just got crazy. Um, and so what you see actually here in this video is um, the new. There's we we've. we've eliminated that entire structure and, and come up with essentially a flip bucket down at the bottom. So so yes, the the it'd be significantly easier to construct, significantly lower cost and, and in the end was money well spent. Good. So good to yeah. hear. Thank you for that. I have a question about that one as well. Um, you had mentioned before that there was an issue there was splash because now there's only nine inches of free board or yep. something like that that's on the water side. Is that gonna impact this at all? Uh, so you're you're Splash meaning on the the dam side of the because, because of the way this is doing that it's gonna so this won't change the water surface elevations in the reservoir. There is a problem that's been identified during the probable maximum flood. Um, probable maximum flood combined with a wind event um, results in waves um, that we're going to need to mitigate on the dam. Um, so that that will get rolled into this project when it's constructed. So is that part of this review as well that they're having to look at it all one big thing or is that a compartment? Uh, we, the, the main focus is going to be on the spillway. The FERC and DSOD don't, don't care a whole lot about what we do to mitigate the, uh, the wave erosion. Um, the, that's that's pretty straightforward. They'll focus their review on this, which is a much more interesting technical problem. So, yeah. Um, so the next three jobs all kind of roll together. This is the Chicago Park powerhouse transformer replacement, um, the turbine overhaul, and the rewind. Um, on the board agenda, not this meeting, but the next one, um, we're going to ask for you to approve a design contract. Um, to get this work uh, really rolling, um, this condition assessment work, and then we'll get into the design for it. So you'll see that in, in more detail at the next board agenda. Um, and as I mentioned, that's all these jobs. This is the wave erosion uh, 
project um, director Peters that yeah, you're asking yeah. about. Yep. So um, this will we we had kind of hoped that maybe we could put some K rails at the top or something like that to, to mitigate mm -hmm. it, but they're they're not into that. They want a, a riprap sort of solution. So we'll have to riprap all the way up the front face of the dam and then build a little riprap berm at the top. So they're okay with that nine inches. Uh, under the PMF flooding conditions, so PMF is the probable maximum flood, so this is how much rain could possibly fall on the watershed, so yeah, at, at, at under those conditions. What's the average freeboard? Uh, so the average freeboard is that nine inches now. Um, under the PMF loading conditions, when we make this improvement, we'll make it uh, a foot is what, they, what's what they're looking for. Oh, they're going to raise the whole dam a foot? Uh, we'll add a cap of riprap um, that will We'll still drive over the road, so it'll be just kind of a little riprap berm that comes over the top there. So to get it to, to, get it to that foot, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to stack racks, rocks on the top of the dam. Yeah. Yep. That's only going to cost seventy-five thousand dollars. No, so that is the twenty twenty-two budget for this project, right? So this is this is for the design cost this year to get all the, the drawings together that FERC and DSOD want. Um, so when you see the capital program in the, the sheets that we've we've put together over the years, you'll see the the all out all in build out cost for this. Uh, for each one and add them up. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. We're just showing you that. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rucker, Rucker Creek Spillgate replacement. Um, this one is is just moving along slowly. This is mainly driven by uh, uh, resources. We just don't have the the resources, uh, the people to put at this uh, this task right now. So this one will get moved into a future year. Um, this is the third of the three jobs in terms of that, that you'll approve the contract for here, the rewind job. Um, the Rollins powerhouse governor replacement is, the supply chain is just a mess for this sort of work. So um, we'll s probably start looking at the design for this project this year, but there is no way that we will be able to get the parts to build this this, this year. So um, look for that in future year budgets. Um, Christmas tree spillgate replacement um, to follow Rucker, and again, this is um, we're resource limited in terms of people to, to get this work moving. Um, the Bowman North Dam upstream lining repairs. This is probably one that will end up in more of a um, maintenance sort of project list in the future, as opposed to a capital project list. This is. Uh, combination of a whole bunch of little jobs that need to be done out there. There's um, adding Sika flex to the joints, which is caulking the joints to make sure that they don't leak. There are some sections of the upstream face that need to be cut out and patched. So it's more of a combination of little jobs than any one big job. Um, so so this will get categorized differently moving forward, I would expect in future years. Um, Rollins Powerhouse Relay Protection Upgrade, this one um, has been significantly hit by the supply chain. Uh, we went to order the relays. Typically, they take three to six weeks. Um, they kind of laughed at us and said, you'll be lucky to get them in six months. Um, so we've, we've, we've essentially punted this till next year. We've ordered everything, and we'll see how it goes. Um, Kim, for these projects that are, uh, are being interrupted by the supply chain issues that you bring up, are we looking at the budget piece of that because presumably if we said the 20, 2022 budget is 150000 but we're not going to get it for yep. 300 working days, I assume the budget will have to increase. Yes, um, and that's something that Nathan and I will be working on over the next couple of months here is to try and figure out what, what that increase looks like. So the delays um, are actually going to be cost. Oh, I figured that was the answer, but I wanted to. Yeah, I, in, in the industry. It's not like we ordered them and therefore we get the old pricing. No. Right. Uh, in some cases, yes, um, but in most cases, you know, no. So are we going to get to a point where we can't complete some projects? Uh, I don't know that we're there yet. Um, I very, I mean, my my department survives on availability, so we don't tear anything apart unless I am 100% positive I can put it back together and get it running again. Um, so we will never wind up in a situation where we can't put the plant back online because of the parts. Um, I, I'm confident we'll be able to get the stuff. It's just not going to be at the time or the cost that we want. So. So anyway, this one will end up in the 2023 program. Um, the Sawmill Dam Outlet Pipe Rehab, um, we're planning to scan 
um, the inside of this pipe to even figure out how to accomplish this job. Um, and um, that will happen before the end of this year. We have a bid um, to do a, a LIDAR survey of it with some wall thickness testing, um, and it's in the neighborhood of fifty, sixty thousand dollars just to come out and, and, and do that assessment, um, and then we'll figure out what that looks like moving forward. Quick question: Is this are those rocks cemented together? They just stacked. It is just dry stacked stone. Dry stacked yep, right. yep. And then on the upstream face, there's a concrete oh, uh, liner. Yeah. That's so. reassuring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> These are actually very hardy dams. The the stacked stone and the rock fill stuff. They they're very very hardy. Uh, so typically we don't look at seismic zones for design. Um, you go to a dam by dam basis and look at the um, maximum credit MCE maximum credible earthquake um, at that specific site. So it's a very site. Um, Fall Creek Flume Improvement Project. Um, this is a fun one because we just finished this one. Um, so we won't, you won't see any money on this one in this update yet because the bill hasn't come in for it yet. But uh, this work is done and the flume is flowing water again. Um, really a neat job, partnered with pg and &E to get it done. And uh, our guys learned a lot. I think, it went, I think it went off well in terms of getting a good product and our guys learning how to work on this stuff. So when we take over the South Yuba Canal, we'll be ready to go. Um, Combi North Capacitor Bank, the scope of this one has changed um, a little bit due to supply chain issues. The capacitor bank is not a very complicated piece of paper. can't get them right now. Um, so what we've done is decided to overhaul the existing capacitor bank instead of buying a new one. Uh, it's similar. It's a little bit more complex from an engineering standpoint, but uh, it's done um, this year. Um, Power, Chicago Park Powerhouse RTU, um, design RFP for this should go out shortly, um, so the board will probably end up approving that design contract before the year, and uh, we'll get the design done this year and uh, move forward at that point. Um, that's flat cooling water upgrade. Um, so this is one that has been delayed a bit by procedures. So last year we upgraded the Chicago Park um, cooling water, but we realized that there's a significant effort on the tail end of that to do all the documentation, um, get all the drawings updated, get everything finalized. And so what we've done is kind of slowed down on this job until we get that job completely documented the way we want it and essentially uses it, use it as the basis of design for this project here. So um, we'll get through the design this year and then uh, construct next year. Uh, Jackson Lake tow protection, we have about a 70 percent, 50 to 70 percent design for this. Um, so we've begun the environmental permitting uh, portion of this project. This, this job is going to cost more to permit than it is to build. Um, so um, our hope is that we can build um, next, next summer or fall. Um, but it is working in the stream channel, um, so it, it's going to take a bit of work to get that all taken care of. Um, Fall Creek Diversion Flumes, our plan is to order all of the material for this flume. The way the manufacturer works is that they take all of their, Octo their, all of their orders in October, they order all their steel for all of their projects that they do for agencies like us, and then deliver it um, in the spring of the next year. So we'll order all this material in October, it'll come in in the spring of next year, and, and hopefully we'll start the replacement. Um, canal lining. Um, we didn't get to this job yet, so we're going to handle all of the design this year, and then we'll go out and construct it next year. Um, this is just a team replacement of the shock creed in the canal every year. We try and spend a couple of bucks for replacing the canal and replacing the material out there. Um, and then the radio tower at the, the new headquarters there has been delayed just largely due to staffing. We're having a hard time the amount of work done. Um, fire suppression upgrade at the Dutch Flat. Um, there were a lot of lessons learned at the Chicago Park Firehouse or Chicago Park Powerhouse Fire Suppression Project. Um, we're applying those, and this is another one of those jobs that we've slowed down a little bit to make sure we've learned all the lessons and do everything the way we want to do it at the next powerhouse. So that Chicago Park one is up and running and, and it's operating. And uh, checking it out. Most of the system is. Um, so all of the detection is, um, the um, suppression in the control room, I, I believe, is operational right now. We're having some procedural issues um, with the um, CO2 uh, in the generator housing. Um, we had to buy new air monitors. Um, our, 
our, our confined space air monitors don't detect CO2, so we had to order some special monitors. Um, we had to, there's some special breathing apparatuses that you've got to get that we're having a hard time getting. So it, th those are all the lessons learned. So we decided we'll step back a little bit um, and do this a little slower. So. Um, Columbia South Access Road, it's my understanding that we're finalizing the negotiations for the easement out there. Um, so we expect to have that easement here shortly, and then that's a very simple project to construct. Uh, we'll just go put that in. Um, the field office design has hit a bit of a snag, and Jennifer and I need to talk about this one a little bit more and where we go, and we need to come back to the board with a, with a better plan. The construction costs have just exploded and we need to figure out what what plan C or D or whatever we're on now is. Um, so we'll be back to the board for direction on that once we get our hands around where we think we need to head. Exploded, they went up 50%? Uh, for I mean, this is lumber, steel, yeah. concrete. I, I don't know what the, I haven't gotten a new number. The, the architect kind of laughed when I said, what is this gonna cost now? Um, and so, but it is dramatic it yeah. increased. So, um, so I don't have a good percentage, but it's a lot. No. So, um, that's flat number two, powerhouse backup generator. Um, this is the one where we got the 300 working day lead time for the switch that we need to integrate the generator with the powerhouse. So we are, um, we found another vendor there. Their lead time is much more reasonable, but it's still a long time. I, I just don't see this one getting constructed this year. Um, the next three jobs all kind of travel together. They're all fire detection upgrades at the smaller powerhouses. This is required by our insurance. Um, we're just kind of working our way through these projects. They're all pretty small jobs, um, but they are um, are in the program here. So we'll continue to work through those and get those installed. We're not going to get those done by the end of the year. Yeah, that, that again, all this, all of this equipment and all of the, the the computer monitoring that has to happen is just we're just not getting the parts. So um, we'll see how it goes. And that's. That's correct. So the last couple of jobs there, um, there was an error in the um, in the original list. Um, so we, when we bring our mid-year adjustment, those they were on the 2021 list. They were on the 2021 list and didn't get completed and and down. We had a paperwork error. So um, so they, when the mid-year budget adjustment comes in, they'll be there. So. Is that why it was a different funding? It's 4.65 versus. Probably, yeah, that'd be my... And there was a footnote that there was um, some of these projects were going to roll over. Roll over. Yeah, so some of these projects, for example, the powerhouse fire detection upgrades, they were approved in the 2021 budget and started. So those are what, you know, those kind of rollover projects that you'll be seeing differently right. moving yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. That's why, that's why you're, yeah, you'll... It's on a roll. Well, that's why we're setting up the the budget <laughs> worksheets for the actual projects are set up differently so you can see the proposed expenditures for each year because in reality, most capital projects take longer than a year to yeah. right. design, do environmental, construct. Go ahead. Oh. So I'm finding I have to buy things two years ahead of time sometimes or order them anyway. Are we... Is it going to be prudent to start looking at that and getting our orders in, even though we don't budget it? I. I and my question segues to that about the Chicago Park Rewind and the transport. Yeah, that's going to be a huge deal. I, I, the, the, my understanding is that the lead time on a new transformer, the size we're going to need, is probably two years from the date we order it, um, and that's that may be longer now. I checked that three to six months ago. Um, oh, so his question. That, that's a new new uh, budgeting. Well, it's a new it's a new reality we're going to have to maybe budget for multiple years given the fact that we need something in two three four five eight years yeah and things we have to order it now mm -hmm. yeah yeah so Katie, you mentioned that um, the Deer Creek power mill was one of the four factors that was impacting your workload for your team and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that and how that's impacting obviously have a lot going on and are accomplishing a lot. You've also got delays too. So I'm wondering how much that, how is the Deer Creek powerhouse 
impacting your workload? Uh, so it's, we'll talk some about this in closed session tomorrow, right? That item is, yeah. um, but we are, we continue to move forward with the things that we can build at this point. A lot of it is communication upgrades. Um, in order to integrate this into our system, we have to upgrade the radios. So we've purchased all the radios um, and, and those we've gotten. So <laughs> we are um, ready for that. Um, so we continue to just buy as much as we can and it's, it's sitting on the shelf. Um, but it's it's been a pretty dramatic um, drain on the overhead type resources. So by that, I mean me, um, Nathan, um, Tina, and the compliance side. Um, the, the field crews haven't seen it yet because we haven't taken it over yet. Um, but on the on the admin sort of side, it's... And there's a lot of tasks associated with the closure of the acquisition. And so just for example, even going through and ensuring that the facilities in the materially comparable Right. Condition. Condition. Yeah, it just takes staff time. Yeah. It was a it was a very large project that I don't know that we were exactly expecting to handle this year. That kind of dropped on us. It's one of those ones that's been hanging out there forever. Yeah. Then you start to think it's never going to happen. Then it shows up. Yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> so, yeah. Knock on wood on that one. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, this, 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 this. Well, and that in fact also has kicked back up in the higher gear. So, right. yeah, right. so between the South Yuba Canal and some of the new for relicensing efforts that we're having to undertake, in addition to the plan for water, we definitely have our plates yes. overly yeah. full. Yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, we're up to it. Okay. I'm just going to say thank you guys for doing a stellar job. It uh, not easy putting it all together today. Keep everything moving. So thanks. All right, we have about three minutes. We're going to take a really quick break and come back at four. I got three minutes. All right, we're back in session with the second half of our workshop today. The plan for water update with the uh, risk, second half of the risk assessment. And uh, if you'd like to participate today, start out your phone or raise your hand or just yell out. It's full of And as, once again, our general manager, Jennifer Henson, will be um, facilitating the meeting. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. So super excited. We're only getting started about four minutes late. Um, thank you. Oh. We're joined with David West. Yes. we got to go through my matrix first. Oh. Um, so just a quick check-in. As Director or President Beerwagon just stated, if you'd like to participate and you're in the room, please just uh, raise your hand and we'll get to you. You know, we're really informal in this meeting, these meetings. And then... For our friends online, if you would like to utilize the chat for your questions, you can do that, or you can also raise your hand, and I will get you in as soon as possible. So, um, as always, we're just going to do a quick check-in on our planning matrix and where we're at. Um, we are currently wrapping up stage four of risk, and so this was a... Um, stage that was added as a suggestion from Mr. Feldman, um, who had made the suggestion during one of our previous meetings. So we added it in, and I think it's a really good idea. It's always really good to understand what some of your biggest risks and challenges are ahead um, before you embark onto strategic planning. So strategic planning is our next stage, and as we stated before, this will be conducted at the Gold Miners Inn. They are in the workshop format as well, so everybody's invited to attend in person if you like to do so. Um, and we'll also have the Zoom feature as well, so you can participate remotely, because I know that some people really enjoy that and find it to be very convenient. And so with that said, I won't spend much more time on the matrix unless we have any questions or comments or suggestions, either from the public or from the board, staff, Anybody? Director Peters. I looked at it. Has this, has this changed since the February one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one half? The only, the only thing that's changed is really the fact that 
item number four, stage four risk has been updated to reflect two meetings at this point, not one. Okay, so that's okay. Yeah. If I was looking at, I couldn't see changing. Correct. Room, I must be able to do something. And again, these are updated in the website. So on the planforwater.org website, we can find it, and it's all updated in there. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions about the process? Suggestions? All right. Well, I think we're ready to rock it. So. We, for the next stage, we have a special guest that we thought was a very good idea. Um, as you are aware, we have hired West Consulting to co help us with our plan for water monitoring. And David is here to join us to actually provide a quick presentation, which we feel is one of our biggest risks, and that is related to climate change. So climate change is really modifying the way that we are receiving our precipitation. So as everybody knows, we are primarily a snow melt system. So that means we re rely highly upon the ability to store snow um, during the winter and then use it slowly as it melts for the summer months and capture the reservoir. Um, so as the climate change is changing and we're seeing kind of some more of these wet, less cold storms and have more water, um, that does m modify how we run our system, and then there's always the consideration of extended dry periods, which as David will tell us, I've heard this presentation before, it is fascinating. Um, dry periods have been happening in California for eons. Eons, he'll go through this. Yeah, that, that long. Um, so long, long, long time. And so the question is, is you know, are we gonna, how will climate change impact our current normal dry cycles that we would normally experience? So I will turn it over to David. Did you want to? You go. No, that was it. She got okay. it. No pressure. There you go. Thank you, everyone, for coming, everybody online, and everybody that's here. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, this is kind of a reprise of a talk that I gave here a couple months ago. Um, and what really drove that initial talk was uh, I wanted to present some data that I had been accumulating personally over the last 10 years or so that gave me some insights of what was going on here in California in terms of what's happening with the climate, how things are changing, and then looking back a long, long, long time to see what happened historically. So data insights to potential challenges or risk is going to be the theme of the, of the talk today. Um, Jennifer mentioned a key word that um, you might think that, that these, some of these risks I'm going to be talking about are real threats as we go forward. So there's some, there's some things to pay attention to. Let's see, what do we have here? There we go, okay. So a couple of key topics to talk about is precipitation and our snowpack. That's absolutely critical to the supply. We have the luxury if you will, of living in one of the most beautiful neighborhoods on the planet. That neighborhood has some mountains that do a great job of capturing the snow during the wintertime and act as a huge reservoir that provides us water in the summertime, hopefully in a controlled fashion, nice melt, and we can control the water and keep it and spread it out over the summer and the rest of the year. Along with that luxury, we have a bit of a curse. Our weather here is very variable, okay? In fact, if you look at this map, and you'll see a term up there, coefficient of variation, don't panic. It's a statistical term, and I don't want everybody running, running home and hiding in a dark room over that, but it just simply means on the map that if you're in the pink area, your weather or climate year over year doesn't change a heck of a lot, okay? Plus or minus 10%. You're in the black or blue or dark green areas, now your climate and weather year over year is changing quite a bit. And you can see California kind of sticks out like this one. Huh? Now, if anybody ever wonders why Congress sometimes doesn't get a good handle on what's happening out here in the West, look at where they live most of the year. <laughs> okay? They live in a nice, quiet part of the country in terms of weather. So, that means that some years we get lots and lots of snow, and other years not so much. Even in 1977, which was one of our epic droughts, we still had two or three feet of snow on April 1st, 1977, at the Phillips Cell Phone. And that's kind of an, an indication of things that are happening. 
So, what's happening more long term? All right. We don't, I mean, long term records are relatively rare in California. We have records that are 30, 40, 50 years. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not a long time to actually get a good handle on climate and how it's changing. But we are fortunate enough to have uh, a long record in Sacramento that goes back about 160 or 170 years, all the way back to about 1850. And you can begin to see some of the variability in that record. So I often characterize that it looks like a drunken sailor in Fleet Week in San Francisco, wandering all over the place. Yes, yeah, spikes way high, spikes way low. If I draw a line through that and squint really, really hard, you might think that it's kind of declining a little bit in presentation or precipitation over the last 150 or 160 years. Yeah, that's true. But that's kind of a time scale that is beyond our planning horizon, for example. The Weather Service defines climate as about a 30 year average kind of the most recent 30-year average, you know, updated every 10 years, but it's a 30-year average. So let's put this that pair of glasses on and see what happens if we're dealing with a 30-year moving average. That's a different curve. What happened in around 1900, late 1890s, early 1900s, Sacramento, for example, was getting about 20 inches of rain a year. At the beginning of the 2000s, about the same, again. 20 inches of rain per year. In 1937, that 30 year moving average was 14 and a half. Hmm. So between 1937 and roughly 2007, about 30 40% more water was coming into the state than in 1937. We tend to think we're in a drought. For the last 70 years, a lot of things underlying our data that we've been observing, we're actually increasing the amount of precipitation coming in. Now that, I think, has changed in the last decade and a half, but you'll see how important that can be in a second. All right. This is where most of our observed data is. Okay. So almost all of the observed data we make to make, to make decisions about how we manage water in California are in that period where we have a steady increase in precipitation coming into the state. Now, I know this is only Sacramento, but it's pretty consistent. It's, you can draw correlations pretty easily to the rest of the state. So basically, if Sacramento gets a lot of water, Northern California is getting a lot of water, too, and vice versa. All right. 170 years, 160 years sounds like a lot of data. I'm a hydrologist. I'm really greedy. I want more. Okay. I want to know if that dip in 1937 was a one-time deal, or if it happens over and over. And we can use tree rings to help us with that. So tree rings tell us that a tree grows faster when it's wet, grows slower when it dries. So if you put a bunch of young PhDs in a room, shove some pizza under the door, they can actually do some statistical relationships between the time where we overlap tree ring data with observed data, and then be able to extend it back in time as far as we have trees and cores to see tree rings that go back maybe a thousand years. So DWR a few years ago commissioned a tree ring lab at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And they actually have a tree ring lab. And they actually reconstructed 1,100 years of stream flow data in Sacramento, the Sacramento River. They did the San Joaquin. Two. This happens to be Sacramento. And you can see that same drunken sailor movement up and down, up and down the whole time. Okay. Just like the rainfall data. Well, it kind of follows that if we have rain, we get flooding. If we don't, we have a drought and low, low water. Not surprising. Let's do that 30 year thing. Here's our 30 year moving average. And what's remarkable about that, for a thousand years, it appears that. The Sacramento River is kind of buried within a specific range, almost like this trading range in the stock market. Never really went up too high, never really left down too low in those 30 year moving averages. So, one thing that tells us is that climate's change, that we have a natural signal of variability that we need to pay attention to. 
The second thing is, and this is where it's really important for our discussions here and in the study and the water plan going forward, is how quickly we can go from a peak to a valley. Question. Would you like me to wait? Go ahead. So your, your axis your, uh, on the left is volume in the Sacramento River. Correct. So how do you equate that to rainfall? Well, you get a lot of rain in the mountains, well, low downhill. It, but th there could be other other uh, forces that, that change the flow in the Sacramento River, or yeah. it, it's just dwarfed by the rainfall? It, the rainfall is the dominant. Okay. Rainfall and snowmelt. That's, the, that's where all the flow in the river is coming from. Gotcha. Okay. Good question. All right. Um, so let's look at something else here. Let's draw a line from the peak that occurred in of that 30-year moving average in 2007. Draw that line all the way back to 1,000 years. Turns out that the peak that occurred in 2007 is in the top five wet periods in the last 1,000 years. Does it feel like we're in a drought all the time? Not here. It hasn't been that way. This has been wet by historical standards. That really start, begins to peel back the onion of one of the challenges that the board is going to face going forward about making decisions about how to manage if we, in fact, have turned into one of the next down, downward trends. Okay. If you look at kind of the timing of the peaks, and I know people online can't really see, but if you go to some of the peaks and look at the next valley, that can occur in 30, 40, 50 years. What's our water plant horizon? 50 years. Those changes are plus or minus 50%, 40 to 50%. How many planning agencies in the state of California are planning for a 40 or 50% change in the amount of water that they have to manage in their planning horizon? The number is zero. Okay. <laughs> They're not doing it. They're looking at historical averages, or at best a historical trend, and we saw what's happened, you know, where our historical averages are based on and observed data. But this is telling us that for a thousand years, we can tr very quickly transition from a period of plenty into a period of not so much in 50, 60, 70 years and stay there for a while. So Mother Nature has this kind of feature, if you will, to be persistent over decades at a time. So it'll wander into a fairly wet period, hang out for a while, and then transition to a dry period, hang out for a while. Nobody can pin down how long those periods are. There's a really nasty one that occurred between 1300 to 1500, lasted a couple of centuries. But most of those transitions are in the same time scale as what we're talking about in terms of planning. So that becomes really important. Okay, just a reminder, that circle that just came on the screen tells you where our observed data is. So we're only seeing a small little segment uh, in our actual observations of what really has happened over the last thousand years. All of this is without considering climate change. Hey, David. Oh, that's my question. There you go. My question for you, David. Uh, we can't, uh, I believe at this time, we can't say that climate change is going to cause more drought or more, more precipitation. Climate change itself, right? It's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Point. I'm not, but my point is, well, is it? It's uh, a trend. Yeah, yeah. What are we trending? That, oh, that trending. Is, okay. Yeah, there where, where are we trending? But one observation also, David, it looks like when we hit the peak, right. we drop off real quick. Real quick. It, absolutely. And you see that over and over and over again. Right. Okay. And that's our underlying climate. Okay. And that's something that we have to pay attention to. Dave, wouldn't it be naive to say, though, that we haven't experienced climate change since the I mean, the climate's always changing. But yeah, that's my next slide, actually. Climate oh, change. That's what they do. Thank you for Chip wrote it for you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, but what's really, if you look at there, that peak of 2007, if I extended this particular chart out to 2020, 
that drop-off would be really significant. So you're absolutely correct that we may be in the next downward cycle by a decade and a half already. And we don't know when that can turn around. Okay. Now, so getting back, climate's changed. That's what they do. And they've done it for a very, very long time. So that's, that's really undisputed. Observed data tells us that. The problem is, we're messing with Mother Nature. We're building billions of cars. We're cutting down trees. We're burning fossil fuels. We're putting gunk up into the atmosphere. That does affect the atmospheric chemistry. It affects how much heat is retained in the atmosphere. And what we've seen, and basically the scientists all agree now, that the climate, or the atmosphere, let's just put it that way, the atmosphere is warm. And I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence that that's actually the case. All right. First, what's happening with temperature? Here's a little chart, circular chart, dating back from 1850. Month by month, each year, all the way around. Next year starts, next year starts. Watch in the beginning, it'll repeat. You can see around the 1850s to 1900, kind of a donut stays pretty consistent where all the temperature traces were. Watch what happens when you get to about 1925. <coughs> Get some wiggles and squiggles in there. Now watch. Post-industrial World War II. Worldwide. That starts to feel like a climate out of spiraling out of control. Okay. So clearly there's evidence that the atmosphere is warm. All right. Going back to precipitation. California is a unique state. It's a big state. The northern half is a big, big part of the state. We manage our water by looking at eight tiny cylinders, about eight inches in diameter. And we look and see how much rain do they capture in a water year. And that decides our water year. So those eight dots are up there. Take them together, take the average, and they form our Northern California eight station index that's used to give us an idea of how wet or how dry conditions are. Again, the average kind of wanders all over the place, but you can see that same increase in rainfall in Northern California. Okay. I mentioned that I gave this talk a couple of months ago. In the last two months, we've added the last two years' worth of data. It's so dry that it dragged that line down, and so it's not going up as fast. So when I mentioned earlier, we might be over that hump and on the next downward trend. That's what it's starting to feel like. All right, so that's precipitation. We know we're getting a little bit more water coming into the state, even though we might be on a downward trend in the tail part of that. Yeah, so we had that snapshot of recorded data, right. and you just showed us that with the temperature. Right. Is there a, a tree ring trick to go back a thousand years on the temperature? Uh, yeah. Yeah. What is that show? I mean, there's lots of uh, other ways to do exactly what you're saying, including the triggering piece, but they show the same thing. Okay. Did, did it just been warming for the last, or did it yeah. really just the knee and the curve started around the 30s? It really started probably when the industrialization began. Okay. In the late 1800s. If you, there's another type of tree ring in California. Uh, where the trees are at kind of the tree line up on the mountains. Mm -hmm. So if the atmosphere is a little cooler, they don't grow as fast. If it's a little warmer, they grow faster. So it's just that little narrow place up there. So um, they used that to kind of track temperature back. They went back 2,500 years, well, twice as far as this. 2,500 years ago, it was pretty warm. Then it sank down, and you're in this, like I said, the trading range, yeah. and it stayed pretty consistent until about 100 years ago. Okay. They start to pop out. And coincidentally, that's when a lot of our industrialization really took off. All right, these guys have the coolest job in the world. <laughs> okay. Say you guys that have cool DWR jackets and pants and snowshoes and nice blue tube that matches their outfit. Helicopter. Helicopters, yeah, they have all the fun stuff, right? So they go out and they figure out how much 
uh, water's in the snowpack. It's not just DWR, there's a bunch of cooperating agencies. That's why they call it the California Cooperative Snow Survey. So we collected data from these snow surveys and wanted to know what the trend was in the April 1 snowpack. And April 1 is kind of when traditionally the snowpack has been as deep, getting the most water over the course of the year. And that, that's a good measure of what we expect to have over the course of the summer. All right, so, yes? I mean, looking at this picture, it reminds me this is an annual that we do. In the last few years, they've, they've gotten to where they can do this from aerial imagery and, and different, you know, technology, technological methods. Have they correlated, is this, does it, do they get similar results? Well, they use this stuff to kind of help correlate what the uh, Airborne Snow Observatory is actually doing. What she's talking about is that the latest technology, that kind of they, they fly an airplane over California with what's called LIDAR, which determines the ground surface. They can tell how far the, arc, the ground is from the plane and put a nice map of the topography of California. Then they fly over in the wintertime. And so it's a little bit different because there's snow on the ground. And they use this and other methods to basically understand the density of the snowpack and use a much more complete picture of the spatial variability of the snow at all elevations to get a better picture. And it's making already making dramatic improvements into reservoir operations from the folks that are using it, particularly down in uh, the Merced Irrigation District and some of the ones in Southern California where they're using it prevalently. Um, so it's making a big difference because they simply get more accurate picture of what how much water is in the snowpack? So this will never go away. This is always needed to calibrate. The air. Pretty much, yeah. It's going to be it, if it goes away, it's going to be a long time. That's so, interesting. How much is coming? Yeah. Thank okay. Thank you. Okay, we're right. Okay. All right. So we took the took each one of those snow snow courses, and we took 160 of them. They had more than 60 years worth of records. Fair amount of records. And 160 different snow courses and plotted the trend, whether it was increasing or decreasing, April and snowpack, and plotted against elevation. So what you can see here, most of those dots are in the red area, which indicates that the snowpack is decreasing over the last 60 years or, or more. Two months ago, about the latest round of data that we added, all those dots were shifted up. Months ago, without the last two years of the data, only 78% of the of the dots here were below the zero line. Now, 92%. So, just the severity of the last couple of years was enough to move that data set a lot. And that's hard to do because there's 160 snow courses with over 60 years of data. So that's an indication of how dry it's been over the last couple of years. Now, you can then take this and look at some other information. So, all right, so actually, it's below about 2,500 meters. That's meters, by the way, uh, instead of uh, feet, about 8,000 feet. So the biggest issue right now with warming is in the lower part of the atmosphere, as you might expect, because it gets colder as you go further. Up in, the, up in the air. So clearly, the lower elevation stations are affected. And not quite so much yet. And most of those on the right are in the San Joaquin and the Tuolumne elevations because the Sacramento elevations are less low. Okay. And we just have minor decreases now above 2,500 meters. So the atmosphere is warming enough. It's getting into those higher elevations. Can you go back to that slide? Yeah. Well, I have to admit, I am a little confused by this. Okay. So, um, can you just go through the, the dots on the uh, lower left quadrant? What do those will reflect? Okay. So, each dot is a snow course. Okay. We looked at the data for that snow course and determined if, it, if the trend for the April 1 the value of the April 1 snowpack was decreasing over the last 60 or so years or increasing. Okay. All right. That, is that the average of 60 years of data? Each dot is an average of 60 years of data? Average 60-year trend. Compa comparison. 
right? It takes an actual yeah. reading and compares it to the 60 here. Right. It says is it above or below that yeah. zero. And we're looking at the trend because each year we have a different measurement. Yeah. And we're doing kind of what's called a regression line through it. So you can actually measure the slope of that, and that gives you the trend, either downward or upward, over the 60 years. So this is this year alone? This is the data reflected? No, that's the, all the data for 160 years. That's the trend. So we looked at all the data for each site for 60 plus years, because some have 100 years, some have only 60. And we made sure that all of the records that we used in this ended in 2022. So it's the most recent data. Okay, so this gives us a pretty accurate picture of the trend for the April 1 snowpack now. On those eight sites. Now this is all 160 sites. Uh, where are the 160 sites? All the way from the Tuolumne Basin to Northern California border. Okay. So they're at the, divided up into about thirds of Sacramento, San Joaquin, and, and Tuolumne Basin. If you want to look at Nevada County, I've isolated those in green. So we've got four in, in the county. Now that's not a lot to draw a lot of inferences, and good news is most of them are clustered around zero. So at least at those locations in Nevada County, there hasn't been a lot of change yet, but you get a couple that have experienced a lot of change, those green ones that are particularly low. Okay? Give you an, and give you an idea of what's happening just in the Sacramento Basin. As I mentioned, that's everything. This is just Sacramento. So Sacramento, the mountains in the basin are lower. They're going to be impacted by warming atmospheres sooner. And you're going to see that deeper downward trend. OK. Pardon? We can do that, yeah. Yeah, we've pretty much all the mountain counties we have the data for. Sure. Okay. So, this is a summary for the Sacramento Basin as a whole. It's basically the, the western slopes of the Sierra. April and snowpack change in inches over 60 years. The average has gone down about five inches. That's on top of an increase in precipitation coming into the state, into the region, of four inches. So we've got more water coming in, and what was happening in the snowpack completely overcame that extra water and dug into the reserve. But that's telling you. All right, what's happened to runoff? Okay, if we have less snowpack in April 1st, snow is just going to melt April, May, June, July, and so on. Here's Sacramento River, April to July runoff from each year from about 1905. Steady downward trend over that period of time. Okay. Which means that whatever's happening in the mountains, if the normal period is April to July runoff, it can only be, well, is that the water moving later, coming out after July? Or do you think it's coming out earlier? Well, I doubt it's coming out to on hot. <laughs> It's long since melted, so it's not coming out after July. So that extra water coming into the state is occurring earlier. That has a lot of implications for reservoir management. Now, and then, on top of that, it's not only coming in earlier, but yesterday um, there was a webinar, actually an all-day webinar, that uh, DWR put on about their water plant. And they're looking at this issue very carefully. And they, let's see, what is the, um, I lost my train of thought on that. I'll get it, I'll get it back in there. I'll come back to that. Ah, um, sorry, important point. I'll get it. Go on. All right, so here's the snowpack region to kind of answer your question. In the snowpack region, the snow courses are kind of scattered throughout that, all those different zones. And the coloration is basically uh, elevation. Green is obviously lower elevation. So you can see that in the Sacramento region in the north. Uh, kind of in everything, there's very little green in the south part. So it's all high elevation stuff. All right, how much water, how much less water is in the snowpack 
on April 1st. I have on the chart here a volume comparison, so you've got volume in acre feet. Folsom Wake is just under a million acre feet capacity, or goes about three and a half. That middle bar is the amount of water statewide that's lost. It's no longer in the April 1 snow. Wow. Okay. Yes. David, you mentioned that DWR is starting to look at this. Um, do they realize that we're a, a state of 40 million people with an infrastructure of 18 million? <laughs> and that you need to have storage before you can uh, manage it? I think that's on their plate. Yeah, I, I don't know for sure, but they, they're looking at that issue. I mean, they've got, a, they've got a, the same problem you have. They're looking at supply and looking at the demand. Well, does this chart over the same 160-year period of time? What is the period of time that we've lost this much water? Last 60 years. Last 60 years, okay. Yes, last 60 years. 25 million or 200 right. million. So, right. So the, that water is not, oh, is not lost. Okay. It's occurring earlier in the year. But it's not all there for us either. A couple of things. If it all occurs earlier, okay, you're going to have roughly the same amount of water trying to go through your reservoirs and you're going to get more spill in the big years, which doesn't do you a heck of a lot of good. Doesn't give you a chance to manage anything. That's one issue. The second issue, this thing about warming and more higher temperatures. What happens to your crops when you get higher temperatures? More water. Well, I've learned how to mitigate that, but usually they fry. <laughs> yeah, well, how about your crops? They want more water. They want more water. I want more water. More water earlier. Right. Yeah. More water earlier. So what happens is that that stuff comes earlier in the year, but there's larger soil moisture deficits with the increased temperature. So a lot of that water now that might have been available to us in our historic climate, not so much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, we have used we have used more water this year than ever before because everything's yeah. dry. I just the, I guess the question also is for NID, how much of, how much water did we spill this year? In total? Yeah, so far. Yeah. I, I mean, I heard about we had a lot of spilling going on early. Yeah. Acre feet. So it it just reinforces. 140. That reinforces David's comments. We it, it's going right. Well, we're also even seeing the impacts with just something as simple as having to wet the canals earlier because they're so dry. Yeah, they suck up all your water. One of the challenges that we're facing currently, which is interesting in the context of climate change and how it's impacting when we get water and when we have to release water, is there's some fairly significant regulatory concern related to temperature issues for fisheries, right. um, specifically in the August and September months. And you know, one of the challenges is our modeling shows that even when we, if we do larger releases in those months, the water's already so hot by then yeah. that it's not helping the situation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, not only do we have kind of this storage supply issue, but there's also a longer term, you know, biological issue just associated with higher temperatures in general. Um, and how do you mitigate for that when releasing water is actually not helping? Yeah, remember that song, the shin bone is connected to the knee bone, right. the thigh bone. Right. It's all connected, and there's just this huge cascading effect that we're having to deal with and learn how to manage. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to have a choice but to figure out how to manage. Is, is there any way, yeah. do, you, do you know if the earlier meltings are um, causing less absorption that we're getting the, the water just running into the delta and not? Well, that way or do we not? probably because it's so dry. Yeah. Last year is a great example of it because last year, almost all the forecast models that the Weather Service did in terms of water supply forecasting were complete by because they underestimated how much is going to get sucked up. This year is a little bit different because we had that little miracle in October, and we had a lot of rain up in the mountains, which basically compensated for that, even though we didn't get much um, precipitation the rest of the year. Had we not had that October wetting, the results from this spring would have been worse than last spring in terms of the water just 
never showing up. Yeah, we had really bad um, capture in 2021 because of the high amount of infiltration that we had because it was so dry. So when it's dry year over year, you just have more voids in the soil profile, which more water is able to infiltrate until it's full. That goes to the how I just referenced how we had to wet the canals early this year. It's because when they're super dry, water just infiltrates. It's not until all those voids in the soil get filled when it'll start to flow. Okay. The other complicating, the other bone that's connected to this process is the atmosphere itself. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere is warmer. So suck more water out of the snowpack. You get direct sublimation, they call it. You know, goes directly from the solid ice into water vapor. It just kind of skips the the water phase and goes straight to vapor. It's like do you know pass and go and go straight to jail and yeah. do not collect two hundred dollars <laughs> that sort of thing. That's that's what that process does, and that's what the warmer atmosphere is doing. Okay, where are we at? Okay. Um, and then this just shows that the Sacramento Basin itself is a big chunk of that statewide shift of where the water is. I have a quick question. Yes. It's two and a half million acre feet. So, so you're saying it, it melted earlier and the snow came earlier, it came in a bigger, you know, bigger event. But still our biggest reservoir, Shasta and Oroville and some of the other reservoirs, they couldn't capture, how come they couldn't capture that? It didn't rain up there. They didn't get any rain up there. They didn't get any yeah. rain. Central California was a beneficiary this last yeah. year. Mm -hmm. Northern California had zip. Yeah, uh, us, you, Bullards, or Orville, Bullard. what would it fall Or This is one of the first years Orville has been of higher capacity than Shasta in a yeah. long time. Yeah. yeah, and if you look at how the storms are tracking, they're going directly through the middle. Right at 80. They go right at 80. Yeah. Folsom is near normal this year. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Go figure. A lot of it has to do with atmospheric rivers, and somebody please ask me about that later because I think we can talk about that because that's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nevada County. Uh, here are the locations of your snow courses in the county. Here's the impact so far estimated in the county that you no longer have on April 1st, that it got shifted to a different part of the year. 42,000 and change acre feet. You've got reservoirs about that size. Um, are large. Some a little bit bigger, some smaller. Yeah, go start from the beginning of that sentence because I, I didn't get my head around it. It's a lot to unpack, I guess. <laughs> okay, so the same computation we did to determine the volume of water that would normally be in our April 1 snowpack that got shifted a little bit earlier in the season, mm -hmm. two and a half million or so statewide. Nevada County's impact is 42,000 acre feet gets shifted earlier. So that of the two and a half million, 42,000 get lost. Yeah. Yeah, no, I got that that was the loss, but I just was trying to. Yeah, you just have to, one of the most important parts in, of our system to function as designed and normally is that we need the mountains to hold, you know, the, yeah, they, it's the ice reservoir. chest, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right? yeah, well, it meters the water into the reservoirs as opposed to all the water coming at once and then spilling out. So right. we're now at, uh, in a challenging spot because we don't have as much snowpack carrying further right. into right. the season. Yeah. Big, 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 big problem. Our share was the 42,000. Yeah. Really interesting. Okay. When, when we spilled more than that, that's just yeah. relevant to the snowpack yeah. change. Yeah. yeah. But did that include Placer County also? No. Just that was just Nevada, Nevada County. County. Just Nevada County. Yeah. I could have done the same thing for your service area, your actual watersheds. I didn't have time. This is yeah. the easiest thing to do. But it'll show that. It'll show something that's very, very similar to that. In fact, Plaster County might even be a little bit worse because if you go back to here, you, know, you guys are pretty lucky right now. So far, you just haven't seen drastic change except for a couple. That's why that number is 42,000, a little bit lower than actually what I expected to see. But now, is the 42,000 got a time? Is it 30 years, 60 years, 60 years? It's still the same 60 year time frame? The 42,500? Yeah, 60, 60 year plus. 60 years, okay. Yeah, and just remember, I think there was a question, it might have been from the member of the public earlier. When we're talking about the Sac River Basin, we're yeah. considered stems off the Sac right. River Basin. All right. right. I get that. So that 42,000 number basically means today you have 42,000 
fewer acre feet in the April one snowpack than you had in 2020 minus 60 is what? Okay, so, over, so the, in other words, it's not 42,000 a year, it's over a period of 60 years. Yeah, it is. 40, that? The, the, getting that? Yeah. No, I understand that's the today number, but that's not an annual number of loss. It is. Yep. No, that's the annual. It'll be the annual. Uh, oh, it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's what I'm That's saying. annual loss. Yeah. That's annual, annual loss associated with, with snowpack snow. melting or not being as dense to be able okay. to freeze and stay past April 1st. Oh, just be a little careful of the term loss. That's kind of an unfortunate word. Yeah, I know. It's time shifted yeah. a little bit. But some of that will truly be lost because temperature and absorption and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, some of it was time shifted by snow coming earlier, melting earlier, and some of it is shifted into straight precipitation, and when our reservoirs were already full and we're spilling, we're not capturing it. Got it. Then it's a loss. Right. Yeah. We've had this conversation before. It's lost to our system. Right. Yeah, just from a storage perspective. Yeah. 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 Fire use. And but, yeah, one of the interesting things is that if you look at some of the modeling that is doing it for climate change, they're not projecting a big difference in the annual precipitation. Mm -hmm. Temperature shifts, get more rain and snow, and fewer storms, bigger storms. That will directly impact the problem you just mentioned in terms of spill. Not here. You weren't designed to operate in that climate. Exactly. Here we have a good question from a member of the public, uh, Mr. Feldman. He asks, could you compare the value slash utility of surface storage reservoirs with underground storage, recharging the aquifer for sustainable supply downstream where the urban demand is growing? It's a great question, unfortunately. And now, really? <laughs> well, it, it's early. We also have lower utility in the mountainous areas with hard rock um, for groundwater storage than you would in the, ba in the basin. But I think that the utility is definitely increased in these scenarios because it provides you more opportunities for storage and operating a conjunctive use system between your reservoirs, mm -hmm. your groundwater basins, utilizing surface and groundwater. Even where you came from down at Lincoln, yep. much different story down there, Lincoln, Roseville area. Yeah, and you know, Lincoln's a perfect example. So all of the groundwaters are basically located in the western area of the city because that is where the soil profile or sediment profile is conducive to storing groundwater. When you get you know, closer to where the rock comes to the valley, mm -hmm. the wedge in which you can store groundwater in just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks because of the rock, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Does that get into the groundwater? No, there's actually some groundwater contamination issues in that um, area where the rock meets the regular valley soils um, from naturally occurring minerals. And so it's not really the best spot. You wouldn't put a well in over there. Domestic well. You could put in a domestic well that isn't very deep. You wouldn't put in like a municipal well in that area. Gotcha. Irrigation? Yeah, you could do irrigation. Okay, actually wrapping up a little bit. So the, the planning implications are pretty serious. You want to get bigger swings to plan for than just about any water agency's ever had to plan for in California. And you're not unique. I mean, this is, this is something everybody's going to have to face. These swings are bigger, and they're going to happen faster. So it, it's, it's an incredible challenge, incredible risk. Brett, you brought up, I think is real. Um, somebody remind me to say something about atmospheric rivers. Thank you. What about atmospheric rivers? No. <laughs> All right, so about half of our water in California comes from atmospheric rivers. Wow. About half. Annually. Annually. About half. All right, let's do some math. You ready? Sacramento, 20, I'd say 20 inches of rain a year. Half of that is 10. I know it's Sacramento, you get more than that up here, but there's a direct correlation between what get in Sacramento and what you get up here in the mountains. 10 inches of rain annually in Sacramento. That's what you, we get from atmospheric rivers. About how many of this is that? Five. five okay. On average, five. 10 divided by five, two. Two inches. 
per average atmospheric river event. If we get so much as one less on average each year, that's 10% of our total water for the year, one storm. Okay. Half, two less in a year, and now we're 20% below normal. So all the stuff that we're doing, and we talk about atmospheric change, if we change the frequency that we get these atmospheric river events in some fashion has an enormous impact potentially on what happens to us in California in terms of water supply. Yes. And if we don't have the storage, then we also lose it. That's that's something to consider for sure. Yeah. Okay. So even beyond that, about half our water comes from ten days a year. Ten days a year. So as much as we like California, it's a gorgeous place. I love the climate. We live on a knife edge out here in terms of balancing supply and demand. We really do. And it doesn't take much to nudge Mother Nature one way or the other into that. You know, we get two or three more atmospheric river events a year. Now we're talking about Central Valley flooding. Okay. Okay. Haven't seen that for a while, but that's what happened. Orville. And that really wasn't. A, I mean, that was that was a year we had a lot of atmospheric river events, but that wasn't really a bad storm. No. Yeah. That caused that problem. That was some other issues. So the average of five a year. That's over 60 years of data. The, or, or did we? Know yeah. That? Basically, that in 100 years or so. Yeah. I mean, we get some. We get 15. Some we get. This this year we had one big October. Had a couple minor ones that occurred during the winter, but really one significant. That's it. So, the way California water, and particularly at DWR's level, water management has depended on kind of if we can survive three really bad drought years back to back to back. Magic number three. We get three drought years in a row, and if we can survive that, we're okay. 20 years, I'm in mean, well, what if you looked at it a little bit differently? What if you didn't get three really bad? But what if you got 30 sort of bad? Anybody have a checking account? What happens if you have a little bit less income than outgo each, each year over a long period of time? Things dry up. Okay. That's what I get concerned about in terms of our natural climate change. If we get into it, it looks like it might be already into one of those longer dry periods that we have to contend with. I heard, I heard a year or so ago, first time, that we were, we were we've been in a 150 year winter period in California. Is it any validity to that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, if you look at that one slide I had where this is the kind of the wettest. Than the top five wet periods for a thousand years. So we're, we're headed for it, right? We could be headed for it. Yeah, when I, when I show this screen, let me back up. We didn't get vertigo from this thing. Okay. All right, imagine you're on top of one of those peaks and you look around. What direction do you go next? <laughs> okay. Right. You go down. It happened every single time, surprisingly enough. None of them took off and went hockey stick on us. They went down. And what I get concerned about, 2007, was a big peak. And among the wettest in the last, you know, 1,000 years. We haven't been close to that since. Yes, I think one of the things for us to think about moving into strategic planning is how do you make yourself resilient for these highs mm -hmm. and lows and leverage your system as much as possible, right? The ideal system would be that you have high elevation reservoirs right. and you have a valley groundwater basin right. and you have reservoirs all through so you can move water and mm -hmm. hold it lower so you can keep it up, keep your storage yeah, available higher, higher and higher be able colder. to, yeah, yeah, and be able to use conjunctive yeah. use. You'd be, right. you'd solve the problem if you could build a few 16, 17,000 foot mountains 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to build a reservoir. We need to build a giant mountain. Yeah. Aren't the clouds involved? Skiers would love it. Yeah. So, no Centennial, we're now mountain building. Yeah. So when yeah. you do your modeling, you're, uh, I imagine there's a kind of a soft model, a, me a medium or moderate, and a severe model to take this into effect. Would the, you're going to look at the severe aspects of this? Oh, I think we would be criminally liable if we didn't. Yeah, we're going to look at the bookends, yeah, right? Absolutely. And so that's, we're going to say, what's the worst case scenario and what's the absolute best case scenario? And then the solutions to which the board wants to fund, you know, plan for, fund, and eventually build, that's more of a kind of a risk-based decision that you need to figure out where you're going to fall in the middle. You know, I always tell the story in Lincoln, you know, they wanted to bring in water from NID to a pretty exorbitant cost. We could also have backup power and roll in from SMUD, right? How many miles away? But to what cost benefit do you get it? And so those are the questions that we're going to have to struggle to go through. And one of the biggest things you're going to have to do to set yourself up for having a good basis to make those decisions is strategic planning. You know, what do we want to be? Why are we here? What are we worried about? Also, we have to factor in the cost if we don't do something. And that's part of what are we, what, who are we, right? You know, you could have the most, you know, we can, if you said we want to be the most conservative possible, you know, we can come up with that system, but, you know, I don't know how your ratepayers would pay for it. So, you know, it's one of those that? questions. It's all of the balancing. I don't think the ratepayers want to pay for it. I don't think they could. Right. I, I, just one, one second thing. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's just so important to have a realization of the kind of variability and how quickly those things can change to inform a lot of your decision making. This is, you guys are going to earn, earn, earn your big bucks over the next year and a half or so for sure. I think we've got a raise. Yeah. Has there been any research into looking at rather than building concrete or rock dams, you know, man-made structures? to utilize the environment, that we were doing meadow restoration, forest we use the natural environment as a reservoir to, to try and rehabilitate the environment as much as we could to have the water move down to the system naturally as a slower response, and maybe don't have such control. Has there been any research into that? Is, is there any? There has been some. I ask you. We actually have a division that's looking at kind of at improving land management practices, particularly grazing practices, as a method for improving watershed health. If you look at, and if you think about broadly, how about overgrazing? You know, you turn out a bunch of cows, cattle, whatever, go, and they kind of clean everything down to the nub, and everything turns to desert, not what you want. What was going on in the mid-1800s in the United States in the prairies? Get a few buffalo, millions of buffalo that were moving around and quite healthy. They're big boys and girls. Okay, they were well fed, grass fed. Okay, what they do? These are fertilizer factories. Okay, food goes in one end, fertilizer comes out in the other. Those big hooves grind it up into soil, and it basically becomes better for that to impact. And then they move on to a new area. And by actually controlling grazing, so you confine it to a certain area, take advantage of the fertilizer factory, take advantage of their hooves stirring up the surface, and then quickly move them to another area and have the whole process start over again. We're actually, we have a, a, a experimental farm that we operate down in um, southern Arizona that's testing a lot of those theories. And there are several places around the world that are doing that. And, you, and basically, at least on smaller scales, they're showing you know, tremendous response in terms of improved watershed health. Whether we can scale that to a uh, impactful uh, dimension in the Sierras, in your area, that's an open question. But it's certainly something for some of the some of the ranchers and people that do grazing up here to consider. Well, sure. I think a lot of ranchers here use impulse grazing. Yeah. Where they'll keep and then you also get the benefit that once they go onto a new grass, they don't they don't go down to the nubs or right. you know, fuel load.
but when they go into a new grass, they eat more. That's essentially okay. the idea. And so, so everybody wins. Faster I mean, they, weight gain, gain, yeah, wins. faster weight gain. Yeah. So yeah. So there's. The problem always is the guy that's not that is overgrazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there, there's examples of that too. There's but our, our local guys are our farm advisors are actually very good at yeah. teaching yeah. impulse yeah. grazing. Yeah. Important thing to do. Yeah. I'd like to hear Jennifer's. Uh, you responded that there. You knew yeah, there's actually been some studies that are currently going on, um, being completed by the Forest Service related to meta restoration that they just recently completed. So we should have some better data in the next couple of years. But one thing I think to remember is that the meadow restoration helps with two things, right? It helps with that infiltration issue because you have a better soil profile and plant profile that's helping from when it's not getting so dried out that it's infiltrating immediately. And then it also slows runoff and it meters right. it. But it's not going to help with this snowpack issue. You know, a meadow is not gonna create more snowpack. Right. Yeah. But I think there should be some good data coming out. Um, and the Forest Service has uh, offered to share it with us when it, as it's being completed. Good. Well, I remember in Nate's presentation of the watershed that, that they were talking specifically about English Meadow and how they were working on on grazing grazing mm -hmm. policies or whatever mm -hmm. with the Forest Service as it related to our to English Meadow restoration. Well, English Meadow has grazing opportunity up there. Yep. We have grazers on many of our right. properties. Um, the other element of some of this research is UC Merced. Right. There's a professor yep. named Roger Bales who's doing yep. a lot of work on tree canopy and and opening up springs that haven't been there when you thin and create healthy forests. So that is some of the research that's being done as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and also, um, you know, a good soil profile and organic material prevents evapotranspiration from happening as well. So there's a lot of really good benefits to it. But what I think it speaks to is there's not a one-size-fits-all answer for the future. I think um, Mr. Feldman, he has, how does the El Nino affect our precipitation in our region? That's a good question. Uh, it does and it doesn't. El, El Nino for us is kind of a marginal impact one way or the other. We can get big floods during El Nino. We can get drier periods during El Nino. Some of our biggest floods are in um, the other end. Uh, La Nina. La Nina. La Nina, thank you. My Spanish escaped me for a second. Um, but then we've also had major events during La Nada, you know, with nothing, you know, in the middle. Okay. Spanglish is good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, one of the challenges has been with weather modeling, specifically with climate change, and the PCWA actually has a on-staff meteorologist who's really interesting to listen to, who I've had the opportunity to listen to for over 10 years now. He, um, you know, as climate change and has continued to impact the polar vortex. You know, it's starting to wobble, which is changing the big jet stream, which is what's causing a lot of those weather pattern changes that we're seeing. And so sometimes you'll see when you get the big atmospheric river coming up from the south, you know, we're right on the edge where we can either get it or we can totally get it missed some years. And a lot of that has to do with how the jet stream is doing so up in the northern part of the hemisphere. So what's influencing which? I've heard, I've heard the magnetic north switching a little bit is influencing the Well, Magnetic jet North stream. has always been switching a little bit. Correct. Right. That was influencing the jet streams more than the jet streams influencing it. Did I hear that right? And uh, no. no. Okay. Kind of outside my area of expertise. Yeah. I know that the whole movement is accelerating. Yeah. Yeah. I have not heard the connection between that movement and atmospheric rivers. It's more I mean, what drives the circulation in the atmosphere is an energy imbalance. You have cold at the poles, warm at the equator, and they're trying to equalize. And so that's really the main driver. And so if you kind of mess with that balance, mess with that dynamic, then you'll get changes. Now, atmospheric river vents are, are the filaments of moisture in the atmosphere. They're pretty dynamic. They happen on the scale of days, okay? Ocean currents if you heat up the ocean enough, and that's happening, 
that you change these major currents that have scale, time scales, weeks, months, years, then you can get some even more dramatic shifts. You know, that Aleutian low shifts to a different part of the Pacific, for example, or the high, blocking high, the ridiculously resilient high that sits off the California coast. That can shift. So, but those are a lot of unknowns that we just don't know what's going to happen yet. Okay, we, a lot of what we talked about so far haven't really got into projections about climate. Right. This is just what we're observing now. Looking back over our shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's and it's kind of scary to project forward from that. So we've got to look for some other things to kind of give you some information that you can rely on to make decisions. Okay, we have one more um, comment from Molly from Sierra Harvest. She states, according to the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Science Service, every 1% of soil organic matter results in as much as 25,000 gallons of available soil water per acre. Another great reason to prioritize irrigation water for our farmers and ranchers who are masters of increasing soil organic matter. Yeah. And that's true. And it's also why we support mulching and a lot of those good things. It's huge. Yeah. Our organic matter is now four, over 4%. And we started at one. So build the soil. Right. Very interesting. Very good. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. See you again. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so we'll have um, the video will always be available, and then we also, I think, do we have the slides? I, we might have the yeah. yeah, we have the slides, so those will also be available. And then David, this isn't a one-time stop for David. He's with us through the plan for water, so yeah. we'll be able to tap into his expertise and bother him with all of our trivia questions. And next time he's coming back, we'll all the answers. Yeah, next time we, he, we yeah. Next time you're going to give us a forward look, right? Yeah. He'll bring his crystal ball in. David, thank you. Does anybody from the public have any more questions before I move off of this? I'm looking at you three. No, four. <laughs> you guys can just chime in any time you want. And then um, I don't see any more answered all of those. All right, so we're going to just tear into um, finishing up our risk matrix. I, and I, I did have one more question. Yes, sir. So, David, Jamie Jones is from the Nevada County Fire Safe Council. Yeah. And they're doing incredible work. Um, the more we can prevent forest fires, the better off we're going to be on all the water retention and, and how much it just ties together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Calder Fire, for example, yeah. you know, just south of you, that's a mess right now. Because mm -hmm. Lost an awful lot of organic material in a hurry. Yeah. Yeah. It's all connected. Yeah. All right. You. you want to start, Greg? Sure. Yeah. Okay. You have 50 minutes. I have 50 minutes to get through a few slides. Uh, we'll move pretty quick through these, board, if you're okay with that. Uh, I would like to get through, we would like to get through this section so that we can jump into strategic planning next. I think a lot of this is. Um, some of what Dave has gone over just now, um, and it's absolutely true, and you'll see some of the similarities between some of these risk factors uh, that are on today's presentation versus uh, what Dave put together. And um, a lot of these risk factors that we put in here are kind of the idea of if this happens, then what services are going to be impacted for the district? So, so we looked at it at a number of different um, elements, and I'll go through these first few slides really quick because we saw them last time. But really, this presentation is st structured around the fact that we are a business. We have 100,000 customers or 100,000 individuals supported through the water that we deliver for them, whether it's irrigation or treated. We have our recreational amenities that we bring people to, and we have to service them and make sure that they're safe. We also have our employees. So this sort of combines a lot of those elements. Um, climate and natural events are certainly one thing, but I wanted to get into our minds as we move into the strategic planning process that there are all sorts of different risks. Now, everything from you can walk out on the street and 
trip and fall, and that's a risk to the district, all the way to a catastrophic dam failure, all the way to a heavy weather event that's going to affect many of our elements. But um, trying to coordinate and keep all of these risks into one presentation clearly is not the purpose of this conversation. It's really to get our juices flowing, think about once we get to strategic planning, what are the values that we as a district are going to want to uh, embark upon and have to um, strategically prioritize for the future. I do have, you'll see in some of these slides, a number of sort of mitigation actions that are just high-level thought process that we can think about in terms of uh, board direction, budget, resource attainment, um, staffing opportunities, et cetera. And so um, I'll just we'll quickly go through the first few slides here. We've seen this, why should we care? We are a water delivery system. Um, we deliver hydroelectric and recreation uh, services. This is our service territory, covers 287,000 um, square miles of territory in Nevada and Placer County. The purple slashed area is really sort of our service area of interest. Um, it's where our water is and it's where it comes from. Just 287,000 acres. Acres, square acres, sorry. Okay. Okay. Acres, Thank acres, you. I apologize. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. We just grew. Yeah, um, no kidding. Uh, so some critical aging infrastructure, clearly we have facilities that we must take care of. Treatment plants, water conveyance, uh, open ditch canal, as well as piped systems, generation facilities, um, fleet, Road, road driving um, facilities, and then just general buildings that we have to operate. These are in the hundreds of different individual pump stations um, to, um, to buildings such as this. Um, clearly, we have a public safety engagement that we have to always look at, and this drives so much of our risk. When we cut a tree down, when we upgrade a treatment plant facility when we do whatever. We have to take into account the public safety element, both for the public who visit our facilities and for those employees that are working within the facilities. Um, 100,000 served. 100,000 people on, in general, I think, is our, is our kind of um, not just not census not numbers. People, yeah. In general, population. Population served, roughly, yeah. Um, this is a little hard to read. Chris, I'm wondering if we can do a quick over to the... You know, Greg, um, so in your prior slide, we talk about public safety risks. Um, on dam safety, yeah. dams classified high to low yeah. risk. Yeah. You know, that's, there's a lot more to that Frightening. story. And you know, if I was a member of the public and yeah. said, oh my God, they got dams that are classified <laughs> high risk. What does that mean? So, so, so I'm suggesting that maybe we add a little bit more definition to that. This, they're not high risk because they got structural. Holes. Yeah, they're yeah. high risk because of the number of people that are downstream that could potentially be harmed or something. I mean, there's some definition that, that is high correct. Risk. I agree. No, that's a good that's and a good I, point. You know, it's just like, I, 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 yeah, when I get asked, it's like, well, what do you mean you got 15 dams that are high risk? So, so I, I it, yeah, we we covered that briefly last time, and yeah. uh, it it you're, you're right should have a little more like an asterisk to it. Yeah, it's not like it's that. not a structural consideration. Right. It is just the way that DSOD identifies particular dams throughout the state of California, and it has to do with the um, uh, the factor of population below those dams and what could be effective should that dam ever be breached of some sort. That's that is the definition That's of sort of way. high and low do we in know general. How many of our dams are high? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've talked about it all several times. I mean, we do. They were oh, sitting. All of them no, 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 no. They no. know that all. We know of all of them that so all that high, are deep. Not, no, low. no, they're not all high. So it's not high to low. Not all. High. No. We have some low. We know. We know the factor of each one of those dams, and I, of the 15, I think DSOD structured dams, uh, facilitated dams, we have a number 
And um, I, I thought I. But we provided this information several times. So it's, yeah, you have. Yeah. You have. But I just let's move on. Yes, you did. We can. So the, we did. Yeah. We can, we so can effectively come we back can back. provide the information again. I think it was probably actually in the last. Yeah, the I, last. I felt time. like we spoke about it, but we, um, we have talked about. It. So the, the the identification of risk is not completed by NID. It is re completed right. by the federal government. And it is in direct correlation to the amount of damage that could be caused if the dam were to fail. So a higher risk dam would be a dam that is sitting over a densely populated. Would be an yes. extraordinarily yes. high yes. risk dam. Yes. Well. yes. Gotts Flat, Rollins. Yes. Those, yes. Are, those are considered. I'm assuming French Dam is probably lower. It, right. It, 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 it's higher. Who's low? Osher. Oh, sure. Osherie. Oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. Milton. Milton is low. Milton would be low. So we can provide, for the purposes of this risk conversation, yeah. the DOD classification of risk doesn't necessarily pertain to what we're talking about. Understood. Okay. Correct. So we will caveat that. Thank you. Yes. Um, so this is a list of what we tried to do here is come up with a general list of what potentially could happen happen? What is a event that might happen within the district's facilities specifically pertaining to a facility? For instance, I'll start at the top left. The middle, the, a minor South Yuba Canal failure. NID's had this happen on the South Yuba Canal before, a minor failure as opposed to the line below it, which identified it as this catastrophic South Yuba Canal failure. So there's a, there's a difference there. Some of this is not scientifically based. I'm just going to state it right now. This is very subjective in many re respects. So the, numbers could be, the numbers could be higher or lower. Yeah. Somebody's perspective could mean it's higher or lower in severity or dollar amount. It depends on what time of year something might happen. A failure could happen. It depends on where it could happen. So this, this isn't... I, I just want to be clear, this isn't an effort in, in pinpointing exactly what would happen and when. It's This could happen and there's a probability. So, for example, for the South Yuba Canal, a minor failure could be a rockfall that takes out a localized section of canal, right. whereas a catastrophic South Yuba Canal failure would be a wildfire that burns all the wooden portions of the cliff right. down. Right. So, so the prob so it goes from left to right, and left the left column being probability. Likely, there's a small key at the bottom. Um, possibly, p unlikely is possible. Probably, never will occur. Possible is may occur at some time. Likely is expected at some time, and very likely is it expected to occur soon. So, trying to identify some of the variability in that. Um, the probability of a, of a minor South Yuba Canal failure identified it as probably likely. And again, the time frame is not necessarily set in this calculus either. Um, repair and replacement costs could be upwards of 10 million or higher, depending on where it is, depending on what it is, depending on how much, um, what the emergency might be. Um, this loss of water supply or disruption to delivery service, um, this is, again, sort of on a minor, moderate, major, and severe classification. And that's based on the loss of water for a particular amount of months, basically, um, to, to the district. So a moderate uh, identification in this classification is a less than one month of demand and noticeable disruption to local delivery area. Right? Um, loss of hydroelectric sales revenue, that's just a number that is identified. It's probably greater than a million dollars of hydroelectric revenue loss. Um, again, depends on the time of year, depends on where it is, depends on what it is. Um, the next column over is regulatory health and safety. This is really a, a sort of a severity and a, and a service question that was identified sort of, again, in minor, moderate, major, and severe, 
everything from this really had to focus on treated water versus raw. So some, from a regulatory perspective, what is the district's risk in a treated water and raw? Minor being, um, minor and moderate meaning uh, really disruption to raw water delivery. That's not a regulatory component of the district. But when we get to major and severe, we're talking disrupted, disruption to treated water delivery and then uh, severe being a widespread disruption to treated water delivery. So that's kind of how this slide sort of prevails throughout all of these different all of these different events. And then there's this final column of potential causes to it. What could what could be the cause? Some of it is completely out of our control, um, and in this respect, uh, a lot of it is landslides, wildfires, um, material failure, aging infrastructure, um, third parties at fault. Yes, sir. If we had a severe catastrophic South Yuba Canal that's greater than three months, what's our supply of water? How long can we operate at normal? No. Or if we cut back, there's there's a major there's probably no. a strategic reduction. But I again We've this 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 classification did not go into it. I would recommend as we as we finish and wrap up this conversation at six o'clock, one of the one of the conversations would be maybe a strategic opportunity for this board is to conduct a real risk analysis for the district on a number of activities and a number of events and plan for mitigation activities beyond that. So yeah. you get into detail. This We didn't have enough time or resources to get into express, express detail on a lot of that, Rich. I think one of the, one of the take homes on this is some of these likely high dollar high disruption of service risks, such as the South Yuba Canal, we need to focus on it during strategic planning yes. as it relates to aging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because if, the South, if we were to have a catastrophic failure of the South Yuba Canal, that is all the water that comes in for Nevada City and Grass Valley. And if it was a multi-month outage, we are very likely cutting off all raw water deliveries to meet health and safety Which, needs. Then the farmers are out. Yep. Right. But, but this is why you know we put this on our radar and then we make plans to address the critical areas so that they're less prone to wildfire we have easier access for getting in or doing repairs you know this is how you start laying out that long-term capital master plan and if and if we wanted to dig in on any one of these and and trust me i mean this is just a few this is just a few things that could happen to the district at certain facilities uh, the South Yuba Canal, a general canal failure, treated water main failure, they're very likely to occur. They're happening all the time. And then we've got sort of a what service disruption could, could that could occur from it. Um, and then just for, you know, ju just to throw it in there, we added a complete dam failure and a complete hydro turbine failure. Some of that was reflected on Kean's conversation this morning about, or this afternoon about the lag time and the time it takes. So that sort of brings me to that low blue bar across the across all of those columns, which is the mitigation actions. What are some mitigation actions that NID could begin developing and through our strategic planning prioritization with some of these events in mind? So some of these mitigation actions that have been identified down here are constantly ensuring that we have a minimum annual maintenance repair and replacement budget for some of our, all of our facilities, and we can't short on that. Um, we have to have a capital improvement plan. We talked about that earlier today already. Work that, come, keep coming back to that, always enforcing a CIP, emergency and standard materials on hand, talked about that with Kian's 300 day working day lead time to some activities don't do and rich you brought that up do we start stockpiling key equipment that we know has that lead time for some catastrophic event down the road that's a decision that we have to make strategic right um, insurance levels are we prepared to go to our insurance company and if something happens are we ready for it so some of these are mitigating factors, and it really, again, is, is these are 
clearly not, I, I don't think we have time and energy to go through every single one of these um, right now. Uh, but they're thought-provoking, and I think we can begin talking about them and bringing some of these up as examples as we get into strategic planning while you're thinking about various things. So this is just facilities and aging infrastructure. We got a couple more elements left to go. So if we can go back to the PowerPoint, Chris. On that. On the, on the, to your knowledge, I think in the four years, we've been, I don't think we've done this risk, and you know, we haven't looked at, the, at these issues mm -hmm. today. Has, do, we, do we know if, if, we, if we've done this exercise in the past? Do we have anything to start from? Of, of so I think the easy way to answer that is um, maintenance and operations departments get together frequently and often to talk about projects that need repair, replacement, upgrades. So that's that capital improvement planning. That is an element of mitigation that we're constantly looking at at very at our facilities and what do we need to do in order to mitigate something happening. You can't always mitigate against an avalanche or a landslide. Well, Some of those things are going to risk management. Have we ever had a developed risk management? We have a hydroelectric risk management plan. At the back of this, there are some plans. So when I get to that, there's a list of certain plans that we do have in place that we always go and refer back to as an operational perspective. There's some plans that I think we probably should start to refresh and, and bring back to the board and talk about more and more. So there, there are elements. The answer is kind of a yes and, and mostly. I think we do look at it. But in terms of an actual risk analysis that has been completed with cost associated and real finite numbers, not that, not that on there. We can't hear on the guess and nobody on the other side can hear you. Okay, so we have a question from Mr. Feldman. Will the PG&E divestiture, I can't even say this word. Divestiture? It's not going to come out. Divest, it's not coming. Getting, will PG&E getting rid of their stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of canals, reservoirs, and hydro facilities to NID and PCWA be included in the risk analysis strategic plan. I just want to make clear for the public because this does keep coming up. PG&E is currently only divesting of the infrastructure um, in NID's territory that we are already under agreement to take, and that is the South Cuba Canal. There are no actual plans for them to divest Spalding or that whole upper system up there. If they were to do that, then we would definitely take that into account. Um, doing any long-term planning that would include us taking or acquiring someone else's infrastructure probably would not be worth our time at this point just because of the unknowns of when they're going to do what. But we would be ready to jump on it if they wanted to sell. Right. So um, as, we, as we look forward, uh, any business is going to have to identify risk to operations via human resources, employees, and culture. This is just another element that we must look at and continue to build upon um, safety and training. Our employees, many of our employees are out in the field every day uh, battling with the elements, battling with the heat and sun and the wind and rain, um, all the way to our office workers, you know, with OSHA regulated and ergonomically appropriate chair settings. So, so we have to ensure that our employees are trained uh, well. We now have over um, 50, we operate with over 50 employee safety training courses from bloodborne pathogens to workplace ergonomics. Uh, talent and talent recruitment and retention is a very big risk for this district, given, given the fact that Years ago, people wanted to live in the mountains and in the and am, among the trees, and now it's really difficult to get people into this area where broadband is spotty. You know, health and healthcare is not exactly around the corner. So, uh, and you're living in a wildfire zone at this moment. So, uh, that is a big opportunity and threat to the district as moving forward. And then just great organizational culture. This has got to be a good place for us to work. We want people to stay here. We want people to be here. Um, kind of again that under underlying theme that you don't normally see or you don't really think about as a business is just our straight up IT infrastructure. What is going to be the cybersecurity and IT infrastructure 
um, plan, uh, opportunity, threat that we must foresee and invest in and continue to work towards. Um, that includes SCADA, both, both from our treatment plant facilities and our hydro facilities, a passive and active network of, um, of over you know, uh, 10,000 per month attempts. I know, I think I said per day last time and everybody dropped their, <laughs> so no, I verified. It's a 10,000 a month, roughly, um, attack system. Just people coming and knocking on our door. Um, so that is a complete threat. Um, we gotta make sure we protect our customers' data and information, right? There's all of that stuff that we, we must do. And then just various physical security threats to vandalism. We could probably keep this one, Chris, and not go to the go to the slide. Uh, so again, this is sort of the same matrix, but a little smaller because it didn't really uh, affect if something were to happen. So uh, an, an event, it doesn't necessarily affect treated water or raw water delivery. It doesn't necessarily affect hydroelectric income or sales income. So we just combined this a little closer and identified three or four different potential events um, that, that are going to come to the district at some point or another. And most of these really have a direct cost on financial. Um, so labor benefit and PERS increases. This is, you know, again, very likely. This could be over a $10 million um, number to the district. Over number of years, I don't quite know, and it didn't go detailed into understanding that. But some of the mitigation actions, you know, we need to constantly look at projections annual labor projections, projecting three, five, seven years out. Um, we need to ensure that we have sustainable revenue. So we're talking water rates and we're talking our power purchase agreements. Um, uh, reserve balances, we need to make sure that we're identifying proper reserve balances so that we could utilize them in case something must happen in, as an emergency. Uh, we need to, you know, workers' compensation is a very likely endeavor. Um, Office facilities upgrades. Doug talked about it tonight with just one of our, you know, our ramp. Uh, we're having to upgrade that, and that's going to be something. These, this building is old. This is where we house 80 people. Yeah. Over the next 10 years, we are going to need to put some fairly significant money into this particular administrative building and Kean's hydro building. They're just not even up to normal accessibility standards. I would argue that uh, many of our facilities and buildings that we house people yeah. is we, have a, we are at the end of life on a lot of things. So we're that we're gonna need to put together serious one. you know a facilities capital improvement plan. Start picking it off. Right. So um, the next section here is regulatory. Another high level overview of just general regulatory. District wide we've got everything from OSHA to general permitting and air quality control for our fleets and transportation. We're seeing a shift in how much diesel uh, vehicles we can operate at any one year and we have to change out those fleets. So that's a financial risk that, that the district's going to be looking at. Um, the treated water side of the district, the, the number of, of um, regulatory agencies ensuring that we're doing the right thing for all of our customers is, is consistently um, um, growing and the costs are getting more, not necessarily the, the agencies are growing, but the costs are increasing. Um, in the hydroelectric division or hydroelectric department, the risks um, around security, dam safety, environmental compliance, licensing is true and real and growing. This is a uh, slide um, snapshot. You've seen that cumulative changes to NERC responsibility and regulations growing over time. So that is a cumulative 1,700 changes um, just, or what is that? Yeah, 1,700 just since 2001. So we're seeing a ton of changes in our regulatory uh, and compliance environment. And that takes staff time and energy and thought and a lot of cost associated with it. Our dam safety, we spoke about that a little bit, right? We, we have an incredible dam safety program. And I don't want to minimize that by saying we have, we have a number of high risk dams. Um, it is just the nature of doing business as a irrigation district ownership of dams. Um, but the dam safety component of ensuring that those are appropriate and proper 
is, is uh, costly, time consuming, and necessary. Uh, and then sort of this on the water rights and use side of the regulatory element, um, this, is, this is sort of a bucket, kind of a big bucket of everything, water rights and water use, not necessarily specific to a particular right or a particular agency, but uh, everything from emergency declarations that the governor may uh, proclaim to curtailments, and that could be an emergency declaration as well. The Bay Delta Plan is clearly um, uh, takes a part in all of our ongoing operations and water rights and use, unimpaired flows, voluntary agreements, those are out there and they're swirling and we'll see where they go. Uh, general permits and authorizations um, and then just high level general water rights around um, and use that is affected and discussed within the federal, state, local, NGO, and then just community groups all the way down to the local level um, where we are. And Chris, maybe we can go to the little more blow up on this one. This is similar to the first document and it it again sort of takes a event or a probable action and sort of goes across to the right, talks about the probability of it, and then it sort of talks about this one in particular goes from general cost to the district, and we, re we reference that as loss of revenue as opposed to an expense to the district in doing something, but more of a loss of revenue to the district based on potential water lost to our system or some, some other fashion, be it curtailments or uh, unimpaired flow. Water that we're not able to sell. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, drought um, that we have to change flows. Um, so, so there's about three or four again listed here. Oh, so so if we go to the right, uh, probability is the same classification as before. So unimpaired flow, voluntary agreement. It's likely. I mean, it's it's a likely endeavor. It's not probably far from unlikely at this point well, in time. Hopefully, we get a voluntary agreement as opposed to unimpaired flow. Fair enough. Totally. Um, yeah. Keeping them right. So, cost of the district that that number we could talk about all day long. I mean, that may or may not be the right number, but uh, it's at least let's put something. It's it's something. It's going to be something at some point. Uh, per year. It it could be over a period of time per year. There's a the greater than twenty million dollars for a voluntary agreement would likely be over the entire term of a voluntary. Yeah agreement so a lot of this is a wag on right. the timing eight years yeah it's an initial a lot of it is a years. wag on the timing but you know i mean volunteer un unimpaired flow could be i guess it really is 20 so, million in a short period of time yeah with um you know there's a cost of not having something a commodity to sell plus mm -hmm. a reduction in hydropower revenue Lost opportunity. Lost opportunity. Lost opportunity. And then from a voluntary agreement perspective, there's also a habitat component. Less right. flow habitat. Yep. Um, then this is the same rows, or sorry, columns, loss of water slash disruption to water service. Depending on the severity of an unimpaired flow regime or depending on a voluntary agreement timing uh, and what it is, which direction, which them, it goes down, whether it's the Yuba, the Middle, uh, the South, or the Bear. Again, very high level thought went into this, not specific detail. So um, regulatory health and safety. And then potential causes of this, meaning, meaning what could be a driving factor to get this in our scope and, and having to deal with it front and center. And Again, just high level climate change and drought. I mean, that's what we're seeing. Drought, we need the regulatory unimpaired flow. The voluntary agreement is sort of a regulatory Im imposition onto districts and water agencies that haven't really seen that before. So um, that's what this uh, document sort of talks about as well. And so it, it has a number of, you know, imperfect analyses, and I will definitely 
caveat that, and, and that is a truth. We, we have a yeah, but we've got something sure. We've got something to look at. Yeah, we've got something to look at. Yeah. Um, the, in the numbers, right? Uh, going down, you know, power purchase agreements changes. We know that those are many of those are coming up in 2032. 2032. So very likely. I mean, you know, so that that timing is within a 10-year period. Um, potential loss of revenue to the district as opposed to what we're what we're seeing today, right? We know we have a pretty good PPA uh, agreements in place. Not get that good. He may or may not get no. next time. So probably end up in the spot market. It'll be different. It'll well, it'll be different. This is something at that point. Yeah. You know, and some of these causes. Water and power supplies in the West are shrinking. Yeah. There you go. So we may get a better one. There you go. Yeah, one of our challenges, I think, um, you know, now for the board is to kind of take this information and go, how does us inform what we're going to do for strategic planning? Yep. And so remember, strategic planning, it helps with the plan for water um, in a sense when you kind of get to the end and start looking at your alternatives for addressing your needs, but also is very useful, and this is why it's a standalone document and effort. We're kind of keeping, you know, the guide rails on the road as we do annual budgeting, as we do master planning. You know, some of um, the, the biggest things, I, hurdles I see for the district in the next 10 years is coming up with a long-term plan for the Flume of Doom, right? The South U the South Yuba, well, it has some very significant risk associated with wildfire. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Well, it happened at El Dorado. Right. The um, FERC relicensing, that is going to be extremely costly, and we're not done negotiating with it yet. And so there can be even more additional requirements on top of it. We have just the general regu regulatory um, risks associated with water rights and curtailments. Um, but one of the things that a lot of agencies lose sight of, and it's really easy to lose sight of, is not doing routine repair and replacement of existing infrastructure, such as treated water mains. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not picking off a certain percentage of your water mains over time, you're, you end up getting into a point, you see a lot of agencies do this, where the average age of all of their pipes together is, you know, 79 years old. And all of a sudden, you'll see within two or three years, your average number of leaks goes from, you know, below 30 to upwards of 85, 90 in a very short period of time. And those become very, very costly. There's a lot of outages. It's hard to provide service. And we also have to keep in mind a lot of our treatment plants are the same age. And, age right. right. So with the purpose of me saying that is we have a lot of heavy expenditures and work to do over the next 10 years. And so I'm hoping that this really kind of helps frame up the strategic planning conversation. Excellent. Yeah. Have we, have we gone to the routine of baiting the treated water lines? So, maintenance every year of so currently, as you're aware, that the district had previously done the programmatic water main replacements. It's, in my opinion, that we should be doing a more wholesale um, kind of a, a water main management plan where you essentially go through and identify based off of average age and condition of the pipe a routine replacement schedule that you can then build in to your rates. So, yes, yeah, so that would occur when we do the master plans that are planned for at the end of the plan for water project. Right. So that would be the next step. We are, we're going to do the treated water master plan, raw water master plan, an operational plan, and then our watershed management plan. And that's where we'll dive into those details and all of that will funnel, hopefully, in service basis for developing rates. And the good news is, is once you do your water models and you do your master plans and your fee studies, you have really good solid models. When you're going to update them on every five-year basis, it's not this kind of giant lift we're having to do now because it wasn't being done, you know, on a, on a regular basis. So let me let me just finish up. We've only got a few more slides left here. Oh, I think and we've got 10 minutes of conversation that we can finish. Um, again, so just some food for thought mitigation actions on some of this regulatory component. Lobbying and advocacy work, right? getting somebody in the capital to help us with and working with other agencies, regional cooperation, 
um, representation as well. So those are just elements of, you know, future activities that we need to think about. This next little slide system gets into what Dave was just sharing with us. I'm not going to go into it, but this is just really, you know, climate change, reduce snowpack, drought, reduce water availability, overall um, localized events, catastrophic wildfire, tree mortality is really, um, really big one for us living here. You can just leave this slide here, Chris. We don't need to update it or the other one. But this is uh, looking at down the left side, those three elements are multi-year droughts, catastrophic wildfire, and extreme weather events. Very similar to what we were just talking about with Dave. This gives sort of a across to the right the probability, um, some of the loss of revenue that we may receive millions in the upwards of millions of dollars of potential revenue should we have a catastrophic wildfire come through our system, right? Depends on where it is, but uh, if it hits the South Yuba Canal, we're in a big pile of trouble. Um, um, clearly, there's a disruption to water supply in any of these events, um, some greater than others. Um, sales revenue from hydroelectric systems, uh, regulatory health and safety when we provide the treated water, that is a big deal. Some of these can be very catastrophic and severe to our customers, and we have to take um, take issue with that. And again, some of the potential causes, you know, climate change. Uh, some of this, you know, is public influence, right? And we got to worry about some of our public in our and around our not only NIDs lands that are out there, but private lands. And we've seen that happen multiple cases. People are just very prone to doing silly things in the middle of the woods. Um, so don't know what we can do about that, but. I'd be surprised what Kian's right. staff <laughs> sees out. Yeah, it's true. Just describe Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> the wild things so, on the capital. So here's here's some of the mitigation and planning, uh, Director Peters, that you were referencing earlier. Here's some of the planning opportunities that we can keep uh, going back to, keep referencing, keep discussing, keep bringing back to the board, think about during the strategic planning process. So employee training, clearly we've got injury and illness prevention plans. Um, secession planning, we want to keep training our employees, keep making sure that we are at the top of our game, whether we get in a backhoe and operate on the side of a cliff or, um, you know, we have to work with a fire extinguisher and we got to train folks in working on fire extinguishers. Uh, capital and operational planning and preparation, there's just a series of plans. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list of what we have, but everything from capital improvements to dam public safety plans to hazard mitigation plans with both Nevada and Placer counties, cooperation with those, emergency evacuation and threat response plans, IT infrastructure planning. So these are just some of the plans that we have in place. We have yet to build. We have constantly needs to be brought forth and brushed off on an annual basis. And uh, staff needs to be you know, aware of it and moving forward on a lot of these plans. And we are on, on nearly everything that you see on this list. And again, it's not an exhaustive list. And then finally, the strategic direction, and then finally, budget resources for us to do all of this that we must try to do to mitigate um, the effort. So that's the end of the slide. So questions or clarification? Nice job. Very good. Very good job. I really like that work. It's very futile to put a number on the on the page, and that's it was. I don't like doing it because it's not necessarily true, um, but it's quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I think this is great. It is a great jumping off. Thank you so much. It's all situational. So until the situation occurs, you don't know. But, um, you know, I just counted up. These are just the very likely things. And that total $33 million plus $3 million in loss of revenue. So I just think, and that's just the very likely. So it's a very likely defined as likely probable or happen. Probably going to occur. Probably gonna occur. Yeah. And then Soon. likely, I didn't even put that. I, I just um, 
I appreciate your discomfort of putting numbers there when you don't have the situation you're responding to, but not having it is worse. Yeah. And so I really appreciate your responsiveness to add this component to our discussion for the risk. Um, and I personally think that if uh, you as leadership feel we really need to take a deeper dive on this to get greater clarity on these numbers. I mean, these numbers are so big that if these things were to happen, that it could devastate the district. And so I think if, if we were to spend some amount of time and money to really understand risk at a deeper level, I think it would be worth the investment as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what my colleagues think, but... Um, you, you want to come up with a grand figure of reserves that we need? Well, I think we it has to inform what we need for reserves. The other thing is we have our rate study coming up, and we're, as I understand it, Jennifer's looking at a renewal and replacement component to the rate as opposed to just, here's your rate. Mm -hmm. So we can pull that out, but that would be informed by these risk factors along with the work that you're doing with the capital improvement planning. Well, plus the FERC assessment. Yeah. The FERC stuff. I mean, that, the, that $33 million doesn't even touch FERC. 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 FERC wasn't listed in any. Right. It was, uh, not, it was just uh, real. I just realized that. Yeah, no, that <laughs> I just realized it wasn't. Yeah, no, it wasn't in there, but, in the, you know, to your point. The $216 million. Yes. Yeah, so. oh. I mean, the number slides around all over the place. But yeah. Numbers sliding right now. Yeah, but the end of the story is we have a lot that we have to do. Yeah, oh, yeah, the, yeah. definitely. Um, I think to Karen's point, it's really important to remember we are due for a new rate study. And so the plan will be to get the rate study going, um, you know, probably sometime after you've finished strategic planning. And I'm going to refer to the interim rate study. Remember, you, te you typically do rates every five years. But you can do them every year if you wanted to. Uh, and then once we get through the plan for water, and then we can do some deeper diving into the master planning, which could include this larger risk component, then we can redo the rates again. So just be prepared. We're going to have some interim rates and fees until we get done with all of this work. Because the process we've laid out is comprehensive, but because it's so comprehensive, it does take a while to get done. And you know, one really does tear into the next. Right. They yeah. all. They're all. Mm -hmm. you, you can't separate out oh, the rate discussion from the capital improvement, from the risk, from the for, from the. You know, it's all. It yeah. all so our next set of rates will be a little bit of you know a wag as far as not having done the deep deep diving you would do in a master, like a master treated water plan. I think that makes sense though because if we don't take an interim step with the rates, then we're going to fall further behind, yeah. and the increase is going to have to be more dramatic. Better to keep up with our wage increases, our construction cost increases, that have it be, I mean, it'll be a three-year impact if we don't take some action coming up. I highly recommend we take some action coming up, and we're also putting out an RFP for capacity fee study as well. Okay, good. No, that's actually out on the, no, those already came back. The proposals came back, so the board will be seeing that fairly soon. Let's see, does anybody from the public have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> any, any four yes, of you? We anyway. Do. Yes, we do. All right, and Lots then our, our friends at home, I don't see anyone's hand raised. So with any, does anybody have any feedback on how we could do any of our process better? Barbara, anything? No, I think this is great. I think today was a great meeting. We started in 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, it seems like um, every, every stakeholder has a little bit of a different interest, so mm -hmm. that's the good news about the process. There's something for everybody. All right, and Mr. Pazner has his hand up. Mr. Pazner, do, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself? Mr. Pazner, you're muted. You're still muted, Mike. There he goes. Go ahead. And we are not hearing you. If you can hear us, we cannot hear you. 
You could also use the chat function if that would be easier to make your comment or ask a question. We're still not getting any audio. Okay, hands down. Let's see if he starts typing. So I think... Um, Could be on the pesticide risk. I will right, keep up with them. Yeah, you know, that is also... Um, that was not covered here. No. Yeah, and it is a concern. It's just, uh, again, yeah. this was not an exhaustive yeah. list, for sure. Yeah, our um, open canal system in general is... It's so, a risk all on its own, It's right? a risk. It's not yeah. efficient. It requires a lot of vegetation management. Um, you know, it's just simply not an efficient system. But, you know, this is something that the board has to ra grapple over. Right. And what we, uh, we have. Yeah, and what do we want to be when we grow up? So, right. yeah. Um, but definitely pesticide use is, or herbicide use, and we also obviously have pests at our facilities, um, is always a long-term struggle, especially when you have so much facilities. You know, I do think that some of the technology as far as equipment and remote use of equipment will become much more um, available even over the next five years. So I'm really looking forward to some of those new, new ways of doing things. All right, Mr. Pastner, feel Please, I, I cannot talk. Please feel free to reach out directly to me um, to share your thoughts. We're not seeing you on the chat. It sounds like maybe you're having some audio difficulty. And so our next meeting is going to kick off our strategic planning. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be at the Gold Miners Inn. And uh, everybody's welcome. And we'll even have cookies. So it'll be good. Still planning two meetings or it's probably going to be bake? around three can we oh i three could bake if i can get we go to three it. hours instead yeah let us um, do some working on the schedule yeah. and we'll get back to you on the actual time i'd rather go three hours two meetings <laughs> get it done one <laughs> all right i think that's all we have mr beerwagon would you like to adjourn the meeting yes so we're going to see what date that was it's that on the ninth Tuesday. August 9th and August 23rd, too. You better adjourn the meeting okay. <laughs> so everyone doesn't hear you Thank getting you. made fun of over your calendar. Thank you, Jennifer, for your great job. Great. Thank you for coming. Thank you to all who are watching today. I really appreciate you being here. And look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, bright and early. Yes. Yes. Adjourn.